Okay, hello everyone. I think we're going to kick off. Um, I think we have a few probably late stragglers and the weather is against us, but we're going to start because I'm going to introduce you to this event before we start talking and um, I might waste a bit of time in that process. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to give an introduction. My name is, for those, I think everybody knows me here, but maybe some people don't. Um, my name is Mel Dodd, I'm Programme Director of Spatial Practice at Central St Martins and um, delighted to be hosting this as part of our fundamental series, um, The Way We Work. Um, so fundamentals, for those who don't know, it's, uh, and I think that's probably our guests, is a series that we've run as, um, started last year, and it was uh, a series that we initiated in collaboration with Oliver Wainwright, Guardian Architecture Critic, and it was very much about looking at fundamental forces affecting cities. So sort of big questions, but also maybe quite pragmatic questions. Um, we started last year by looking outwards, interrogating the forces like land, planning and housing. And this year's series, of which this is the concluding um, event, looked the fo we focused the spotlight back inwards onto um, the profession itself. So um, really trying to take a hard look in the mirror at the way we work. So that's um, where it sits. It's a concluding part of the series and um, it's a, an event that lasts longer than just leaving debate as well. I just wanted to very quickly talk about two things. One, the motivation for this particular um, symposium and the guests that we've invited. Um, give you a very quick overview also of the structure of the next day and a half. So um, first of all, I think for me, and it's great to see a lot of my students here, um, it's as an educational program concerned with challenging, even disrupting conventional forms of practice, it, it seems important to provide a platform which really looks at the world of architectural practice as it is. Um, it felt to us in the program that a really direct engagement with the fundamental forces driving work in practice was a bit overdue. So, so that's, one, that's one remit and that explains why I think this is a really important event for our students. Um, second, I think we feel that questions concerning architecture and labour have important currency at the moment. I'm sure you all feel the same. Um, they're coming into sharp focus through a lot of um, a range of protest, uh, civil actions that really respond to some contemporary events, events like Grenfell Tower fire and the collapse of Carillion that are really impacting on our profession and also part and parcel of very deep concerns and anxieties about some of our, um, I guess, the, for, the, the sort of forces that are affecting our cities and the means of producing cities. So that's the second one. I think it's extremely timely. Um, and finally, and perhaps most significantly, the symposium's been undertaken in partnership um, with Escala de Citage, Sao Paulo, excuse my pronunciation, ladies, um, and that's uh, really something I just want to quickly focus on a little bit. Um, this is to support and I guess to further disseminate an initiative that um, the school, in particular um, people in the school who are here today, initiated. Um, the Counterconducts Initiative, or Contra Condutas, was a project developed by curators Carol Tornetti and Ligia Nobre, first keynote speakers of the day. Um, and really it was... Uh, an action by the Brazilian Ministry of Public Labor Prosecution which sued a large construction company for subjecting workers to conditions of contemporary slavery was a trigger for a year-long project that they have been running um, that really started to impact on public debate affecting major infrastructure works, migration, labor, and slave-like work in the contemporary situation in terms of the architectural profession globally. So their project culminated in um, an international symposium um, last year and also an exhibition and also a rather beautiful book um, which uh, you'll see outside and also um, later on. We're delighted to host the book launch in the UK for this book. So really the intention was to disseminate and further expand some of the questions that they were asking to celebrate the important works that they commissioned as part of their project and um, to build a maybe a wider network and conversation um, and to hopefully keep, keep our partnership going. So we're really delighted to host the book launch. Everybody is welcome at the end of this session. We have free drinks. Um, and uh, I believe that the books are free issue. Um, it's a, a wonderful book and some of the contents involves um, essays and pieces by um, some of the participants in this symposium as well as many other practitioners, writers, activists. So it's um, a really wonderful thing to have. 
Um, in putting together the programme for the event, we deliberately drew on some of the participants from the original Contra Condutas um, project, not only um, Leisure and Carol, but also Peggy Dima, um, Architecture Lobby, and also of Yale, Professor at Yale, and also um, Kadambari Baxi and Laura Diamond Dixit of Who Builds Your Architecture, who've also contributed to that book. Um, but we've also included some new voices, academics, writers, activists, and um, academics from um, the UK and Europe. And really that's the intention is to further and sort of widen, play tag team, widen the audience and, and take the discussion into a broader debate. So I'm really delighted to welcome those guests. Many people have traveled against all odds, sometimes being in the, in the air for 24 hours. Um, so it's a privilege to have you travel so far and, and come to this inaugural symposium because this is the first symposium that Spatial Practices has run. Um, very quickly to finish on, before I introduce the first speakers, to the structure in the event is quite simple. I just want to go through it. We have three panels. They're running over one and a half days, so each panel is half a day in length. Each panel will take a leaf from the Fundamentals Evening Debates in the sense that it will be a collection of speakers. Um, and then they will be joined by a chair to catalyse a, a discussion at the end. Um, in this case, unlike Fundamentals, there's a more generous period for each person to talk, so we're having proper presentations from, from three speakers per session. Just um, to introduce you to those sessions, and they'll be introduced on each at the beginning of each, but a broad introduction. The first panel, and you should have this wonderful self-tanning um, thing. Uh, so have a look at those, um, give you a broader introduction to the, to the panels, but very briefly, the first panel to today, Architecture and Capital, introduces the Contra Condutas project um, by the curators and more broadly also contextualizes the themes of the symposium with presentations from Leisure and Carol, Adam Carser from the RCA, Sid Trigg and Charlotte Grace from Concrete Action and the discussion will be chaired by our own Alex <coughs> Wilnock Smith. The second panel tomorrow morning, Architecture's Labour Force, starts to drill down into questions about the workforce involved in the construction of buildings and the city, with presentations from Kadambari Baxi and Lauren Diamond Dixit of Who Builds Your Architecture, Marsha Bradfield and Sophie Hope of the Precarious Workers Brigade, and our own Shumi Bose. And then the discussion there will be chaired by curator and writer Brendan Cormier. And finally, the third and final panel, Architects as Workers, will bring it tomorrow afternoon, will bring the discussion firmly into the domain of the architectural profession with presentations about the architectural work of, um, from Peggy Dima, um, Professor at Yale, Rainier de Graaf, Director at OMA, and Jeremy Till, our Head of College and Professor of Architecture. So the discussion will then be chaired by me and hopefully that, that's the, that will be pulling it all together as a summation. So throughout the two days, hope you can um, chat at tea times and breaks. After the three presentations, we will have a tea break, so people can have a breath of fresh air and get some questions together for the final discussion. Um, obviously, also do that at the book launch later. Um, to remind you, our audience is a lot of students and staff, so I think, um, as well as external guests and professionals, so I think it's great to, to think about this in terms of a student perspective of people moving out into the profession and some of the dilemmas and practical things that we can talk about to uh, not depress them about this topic. <laughs> slightly worried that it held, might have a depressing tone. So, let's, uh, so, so I think it'd be really great if we could always try to end on an uplifting note of action. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first panel and the first speakers. Um, the format, uh, as I said, is that I'm going to introduce, um, we'll have the presentations and I'll introduce each with a biography before they start and then we'll um, have a break before we start to talk about, um, uh, have a chair of discussion by Alex. Um, the first uh, panel, Architecture and Capital. Um, I'll just read you um, the abstract. So architecture costs money, lots of money. The relationship between architecture and capital is fundamental yet fraught. As neoliberalizing market fundamentalist agendas have taken hold of our contemporary cities, the steady commodification of our urban and social fabric extends into all aspects of our daily lives. And I know that students understand this as well, including the way we work. The ethical dimensions are of deep concern and revealed in the way in which labor is affected through privatization, deregularization, liberalization. So the interrelationship between the neoliberal city, its means of production, and the labor it co-ops and implicates is the subject of the panel. Our first speakers, um, coming all the way from Sao Paulo, um, are Ligia Nobre and Anna Carolina Tonetti. Um, they are both um, 
working with Escala di Sitagi, which is a, a school of architecture in the centre of Sao Paulo. Ligia Nobre holds a master's degree in history and theory from the Architectural Association and is a PhD candidate in aesthetics and art history at the University of Sao Paulo. She was adjunct curator of the 10th Sao Paulo Architecture Biennale and currently she teaches at Escala di Sitagi and is a member of El Grupo Interior. Carol Tonetti is an architect and PhD candidate in design, space and culture at FAOSPI. She teaches at Escala di Sitagi where she coordinates the series of courses devoted to means of expression and drawing. She organises different strategies of action combining art and architecture and is also a member of the practice of Grupo Interior. So, a um, very warm welcome for Carol and Nietzsche. Thank you for improvising for the start. Yeah, can you hear? Yeah. Yes, they can hear. Yeah. So, really, really glad to be here. Thank you so much, Mel, Chauvin, the whole. Central St. Martins. Um, we, we start together, actually, Carol's going to start, then I, I do the second part. Yeah. Um, just to say, really happy indeed, we really looking forward for these two days. And we also want to thank all the people also in Sao Paulo. There were more like than 250 people directly involved in this project. It took two years. So it's a collective endeavor, of course, for this scale. And I'm really happy to be here. So we're going to present you some different perspectives. There were plenty, I mean, much more. No, it's a different... Yeah. It's, it's a huge time. effort and a huge uh, uh, collective work we did. So I'll start uh, maybe uh, giving a context on the, uh, how the, the project arrived at the school. So... Um, during 2013, uh, Brazil was really optimistic. Uh, we had a like, international uh, stage, the country was coming off as modern, progressive, and the regional leader. Uh, the year ended with an uh, unemployment rate of 5.4%, the lowest level in history, as the economist was also pointing that out. And the GDP was um, uh, presented a growth of 2.3% and the World Cup and the Olympics promised improvements uh, in the nation's city with investments over $8 billion in a package of infrastructure, public facilities and urban mo mo mobility projects. So this was for us, uh, uh, the process of redemocratization seemed really consolidated. Um, but in June uh, 2013, however, uh, after the protests that began in Sao Paulo against a 20 cents uh, hike in bus fare, uh, these protests spread uh, throughout the country. Uh, to several other cities, uh, driven by many grievances as the low quality of public services, corruption, um, police violence, and um, among many others. Uh, and this was a sign of this growth cycle's collapse, uh, expressing all of its contradictions. So... Regarding now contra condutas, uh, meanwhile, in 2013, in the city of Petrolândia, which is this very small city in the northeastern state of Pernambuco, uh, cars circulated through the city with loudspeakers announcing job opportunities in Sao Paulo. Uh, those interested would have to pay a fee to travel to Sao Paulo and to cover the costs of transportation and a month's uh, rent in a house. Uh, in return, they would have guaranteed jobs awaiting for them once they reach their destination. The work site was the Terminal 3 at Guarulhos Airport. Uh, Guarulhos Airport, uh, so, uh, so that those are the main cities where the workers came, and that is Sao Paulo. And Guarulhos Airport serves the nation's biggest city, whose expanded metropolitan complex has 32 million residents, and was just one of the many large-scale projects at the time, categorized under a differentiated hire, hiring regime. 
uh, a law which loosened regulations on building contractors uh, hired on public bids projects, expanding the already delicate dynamic of convergence between the state and the private companies. So this is Sao Paulo and uh, downtown, the distance between downtown Sao Paulo and uh, Guarulhos Airport. Um, so as soon as they arrived at the construction site in Guarulhos, the workers uh, who had come from Pernambuco were grouped with others um, from other parts of the country, subjected to a pre-employment medical exam and instructed to await contact from the, their, from the company. Some took lodging in uh, slums in the region, others gathered uh, in houses set up for workforce uh, recruiters, and the 38 men from Petrolândia ended up living in a unit with three bedrooms and just one bathroom. Uh, it had no furniture, no beds, and no mattresses. Um, so some of them slept on mats, others uh, had to sleep on the floor uh, over cardboards and bed sheets. And after a few days, only some of them were hired. Uh, and there were no plans for new job openings. So since they were jobless and had no income, many had to beg for food in the neighborhood. Others went into debt. Uh, brought over by workforce recruiters uh, to serve 30 party contractors, which is a very common phenomenon in the construction industry. Uh, this uh, loosening of, of labor laws enables this, this sort of, of third-party contractors and uh, these workers were just uh, taken in the ranks of reserve uh, with negotiated reductions in their salaries. Subcontracting makes oversight and accountability more difficult, resulting in dispersal of responsibilities in hiring. Uh, it starts with the values negotiated between the controlling developers and the supercontractors having a domino effect which makes it unviable for legal obligations to be kept. Uh, despite these difficulties, around two months later, the construction company responsible for the constru construction site of the Terminal 3 and the Public Ministry of Labor formed one of the biggest legal settlements related to slave labor in the history of Brazil, uh, in which the construction company uh, consented to correct its conduct and pay a fine as a compensation of damage. Part of this history is depicted in the documentary Terminal 3, which has been exhibited uh, uh, just in one of the TVs outside. So a total of 111 workers were rescued during this inspection, uh, among them six native Brazilian of the Pancararu people. And this operation involved the guerrilla work uh, on the part of the construction workers union because they were not, they were prohibited for entering the Terminal 3 construction site. And accusations, um, and, and of course it happens also because these different uh, subcontractors, uh, they, one of them, uh, that there was a dispute between them, and so this ended up as uh, helping to, to, to get to the case. It is also a consequence of a work developed in Brazil since 1995 when the federal government recognized the existence of slavery and the slave work in the country. So according to public uh, data, 47,000 people have been rescued from slavery in Brazil in the last years. So one of the first interventions of the counter conducts project was precisely to demonstrate the disputes surrounding the definition of slavery work. So this is the law, of course it is in, in Portuguese, but um, it means that to reduce someone to conditions analogous to slavery, either by subjecting them to forced labor or ex exhaustive work days, by subjecting them to degrading work, and this is when 
we start to see the marked uh, uh, part of the text. So subjecting them to forced labor, exhaustive work days, by subject subjecting them to degradating work conditions, restricting by any means their movements by reasons of debt incurred with employers or representatives, prohibiting workers use of many means of transportation in order to keep them at work site, maintaining ostensive surveillance over the work site, or uh, sizing workers' documents or personal belongings in order to keep them at the work site. So uh, there has been a lot of discussion about that in the Congress, Brazilian Congress, and especially the, ruralist, uh, the, the rural group they are the ones that want to suppress this part of the, of the law. So the fine paid by this construction, which is called uh, OAS, OAS uh, this same company I have is the one that, according to The Guardian, is uh, connected to the current president of the Republican electoral campaign. So, and Ligia, now, uh, Ligia is then going to talk a little bit of what happened during the project and the impeachment process. So, uh, so Escola da Cidade, which is a non-profit organization uh, recognized by the Ministry of Justice as an organization of federal public utility, received part of this uh, fine to fund and to develop a sweeping project that would question and impact the debate on large-scale infrastructure projects, migration and slave labor conditions in the contemporary world. As a consequence of this historic moment and implicated in its contradictions, the Counterconduct project was developed as a proposal of collective indirect reparations, and it has sought to respond to questions raised by a term of adjustment of conduct. So this is why we chose to name it counterconducts, and also because uh, counterconducts serve as a critical and reflex a reflexive position taken in relation to the term conduct as addressed by Foucault via Montaigne. Uh, to refer to the techniques and procedures in terms of ambivalent character uh, uh, of how we, uh, how people are conducted, how we uh, get conducted and implicated in the conduction of, uh, on the conductive act. So this is when we, uh, we start to uh, work also in uh, with Victor and having this uh, uh, visual identity that was uh, together and resulted in this beautiful book that Mel told you. So, implicated in this process, we questioned ourselves about our, our own responsibility and our ability to respond in the face of systematic human rights violations. We questioned ourselves about the value of the funds designated to the project of indirect reparations, considering the value of the damage paid to the enslaved workers. Uh, we questioned the settlement reached by the court from the perspective of mitigating the penalty. And we asked ourselves what would constitute counterconducts, individual, collective, uh, professional and academic, institutional and activist that intersect the practices of law and architecture in this context. So it was up to us to provide a critical response uh, from a perspective supported by the ped pedagogical didactic structure of Scola da Cidade. Uh, to be situated in the context of pol a political pedagogical culture, a characteristic already present in the school in many of its activities, but with a potential, uh, great potential to be expanded. Uh, the necessary awakening in the production of knowledge surrounding systems and relationships of work led us collectively to intersect the courses, the studios, seminars, and scientific research. 
uh, to propose a survey of existing conducts and additionally other conducts as a, out, an, an alternative for politically redimensioning the normalized procedures in the realm of professional activities. So, as Ligia told us, the structuring of the project began with an initial group of professors and expanded into a coordinated network of over 250 people and 50 social, cultural, and educational organizations, uh, not only in Sao Paulo, but also in other states. So, for us, it was important to have two main axes. Uh, axis of non-hierarchical relation, one that was related to the idea of research as an intervention, and the other, uh, the intervention as a research. Uh, the proced uh, procedural stages and experimentations were given priority as basis that led us necessary reconfigurations during the course of its development. The more academic studies, artistic interventions, seminars, and journalistic uh, research, uh, research intersected themselves, the more correspondences were established. And so we soon got to this uh, diagram also uh, made with Victor, Victor. So this was a very important contribution along the project. Uh, uh, Victor is one of the school uh, teachers, and he also integrates o Grupo Inteiro uh, with me and Ligia. And he, he designed all this visual language uh, that was initiated as a workshop uh, with the participation of the students, and it was developed by him as one of the interventions, of the artistic interventions. So, Victor adopted existing visual schemes associated with the public realm that he found on the web. And then he, he, he started developing diagrams that could register the project in process, making visible the sharing of the content and expressions, generating compositions that revealed the interplay of, plow, of power uh, that span it. The diagram focus on the centrality of the relationship between architecture and labor. So at that point, some of the questions presented uh, by the research group was, what, what role do the architect and the architectural project have in reducing or increasing the level of violence on work sites? Uh, what impact do the production and consumption of the neoliberal city have on the degrading labor of the construction industry? How can we challenge the large-scale infrastructure, projects that consume the environment and destroy ways of living? How do these regional realities fit into the globalized world? And all of those questions were really precisely synthesized by one rhetorical image proposed by a journalist. Her name was Sabrina Dura. She worked with us. Uh, and she asks all of us if the plywood fences that encloses the conceal of the work sites of big constructions, if they were removed, what would passers-by see? Uh, so she answers that certainly they would see not the macro relationship between production and labor that make the contemporary construction site one of the main fields of the extraction of profits based on the over-exploitation of the non-remunerated labor of construction workers. So this is how I get to two of our research uh, projects that I would like to uh, show you because I believe they address uh, some answers to these questions. So the first one, the first study of interest, uh, is based on the analysis of the employment of prefab in the design and designing and construction of the Terminal 3, which is this awful building. <laughs> and, um, it, in comparison with the model of the SARA Network Technology Center, 
which designs and executes uh, the work of uh, João Figueiras Lima, which is a Brazilian architect, uh, also known as Lele. And he is uh, really a reference uh, and a milestone in Brazil architecture in development of prefab construction technology. So, This research was coordinated by a professor, Anália Morim, and students, and they analyzed these two projects, uh, seeking to underline the contradictions that show a planned strategy to disrupt the construction process with the objective of, expand, of expanding profit and corruption. Uh, she, she starts by remember, remembering us of uh, one elementary and perhaps too obvious uh, matter. The budget for architectural project corresponds to an average of 1% of the total value of the construction. And it's only through the executive project uh, in all of its complexity uh, that materials are uh, specified, uh, the responsibilities assumed, the construction planned, uh, and, this, uh, and the operations of the work fronts can be foreseen and the final costs can be assumed. When considering a public work, the ex executive project is an essential piece in any conscious act of transformation, guaranteeing transparency in uh, the management of resources. With innumerable social ramifications, the project is the first element to be attacked by outside interests. Negotiators and lobbyists from the building material industry thus undermining its technical and ethical coherence. So according to Analia, the timing of public projects in relation to politicians' terms and re-election has led us to adopt a different logic in the execution of works. Uh, one based on urgency, uh, where the buildings uh, are, uh, are started to be constructed before the conclusion of their complete projects. And often enough, this political urgency demands that the project be completed before there has been an adequate amount of time for proper study. So the architects, as the authors of the project, uh, and the individuals who potentially knows the whole, uh, has been removed not only from the construction site, but from the development of the executive projects, uh, which has been handed over to construction and management companies with implementation of a law. Uh, in 1993, this law handed over to management firms the responsibilities, the responsibilities of uh, uh, reconciling and adapting projects to pressures of the markets. Uh, so the architect no longer enjoys the profession's per prerogative that is to conceive the whole uh, and organize the harmonizing of knowledge there involved. Um, the ill-conceived project therefore becomes a piece without authorship and transparency. Uh, this disruption intensified in the 1990s, coinciding with the dismantling of public or technical staff capable of producing, hiring, and overseeing the big investments, enabled the implementation of a system known as fast tracking, which is the system implemented in the Terminal 3. So, this also happened, uh, these disruptions between uh, designing uh, and, and the hiring of contractors also happened in Rio. And this is a project coordinated by Ana Luisa Nobre in Rio. And it's also in a website where you can see all these disjunctions between how they hired the contractors and the architects and how there are many missing links in that. So, for the expansion of the Terminal 3, uh, there was a previously, uh, previously there was a project 
which was uh, shelved in 2011. The justification being the urgency of the approaching 2014 World Cup. A number of uh, projects were submitted to a similar process in Rio, which I, I showed you the, the graphics. So the developer, the, in the case of the Terminal 3, that was this uh, OIS uh, uh, contractor, took the responsibility of hiring the staff, including those on the project. The reduced timeline inverted the sequence between planning and execution. The compatibility process took just three months. Uh, while the foundations has already been laid, uh, there, was no, there was not a full uh, project design. So the necessary prefab, uh, prefabrication to correspond with the pace of the construction did not generate uniformity because it, you need at least uh, one, 100 repetitions to justify the cost um, of the molds. So the hiring of several suppliers result in complex details and connections that will be difficult to maintain in the future. Uh, the firms, the consulting firms, were deployed to remedy the problems rather than avoiding them. The selection of materials were determined by pressures from the marketing, from the from, from the market. Uh, so there was a lot of construction flaws. The number of drawings generated was. Uh, like 6,000 drawings, presentation boards, uh, which lead us to deduce the conditions of works and pressure on the architects working in such a hurry. Uh, and of course there was the project, there was a lack of global vision planned. Uh, it was a chaos. Uh, in contrast, the SADA, the hospital, the architect was responsible for the entire of its execution. He was the technical coordinator and the one responsible for the factory of components which he created and assembled. The conception, production and, ass and assembly of the prefab elements were constantly verified and adjusted, adjusted according to necessary conditions of comp compatibility. So, I believe you can also reach and read the, the smaller parts, which are the translated ones, because... So having the human being as a central element of the project, the comfort of the future patients was an important, as, as important as the labor conditions, which is what some of these graphics shows. Uh, the size of the pieces, uh, the way they can be handled by the constructors, um, they, they were all, uh, you know, a necessary and important element of the designing of this uh, SARA uh, project. Um, so, again, for the expansion of, uh, let me see, yes. So the workers at SARA Hospital participated in a system of labor in which they, the, their tasks were defined and the projects were specified by drawings, perspectives, prototypes and models. And while there was a hierarchy, the contribution was shared and the work was moderated with breaks for rest. Many details were adjusted on the construction sites and uh, then returning to the factory for redesign. The factory workers received training in all sectors, making them full-fledged uh, construction workers. Uh, meanwhile, in the OIS construction site, qualified workers were simulated as carriers of bags of cement, sand and rubble. Uh, acquiring an array of construction experience, experience that invested little or nothing at all in their training as part of a qualified workforce. And around 8 million Brazilians, which is around 10% of the nation's workforce, are construction workers who are mostly functionally illiterate and obliged to migrate around the country in search for employment. Um, 
So the objective of, a, of capital is productivity and a return on investment and not education and health of the workforce. So this is like a typical uh, construction site uh, in Brazil and the conditions uh, in which the workers uh, do their, their work. Uh, so this availability exists precisely due to the forces of capital which operate in a manner that does not guarantee full employment. So another uh, very important example uh, to bring you today uh, uh, is uh, to confronting the relationships, to, to, to confront the relationships between labor and construction industry are the self-managed collective task forces, which we call Muchirão. They began in Sao Paulo in the 1980s, and they represent uh, they were represented in a counter conduct project by the writings of Icaro Lira, which is in our book, and the participation of uh, Biatoni and Cristiani Gomes in the international seminar held in Sao Paulo around a year ago when Mel was with us. So the, the grassroots movements fighting for housing in Sao Paulo are highly organized and possess a clear political aware of the fact that the production of the urban space perpetuates poverty by relegating laborers to the more precarious areas of the outer city limits, limits of metropolises in the face of super speculation of the price of land. The socially produced urban infrastructure is not guaranteed to them. So these are some uh, Google uh, street view pictures of uh, a neighborhood in Sao Paulo where you can see uh, different types of uh, housing. Um, so the self-managed collective task force does not represent a solution to Brazil's housing problem, but it did establish an important alternative to the polarity between the precarious do-it-yourself housing on informal lots and the housing complexes provided by the state, which end up hiring private companies and reproducing the hegemonic capitalistic production on the construction industry's traditional construction site. One that's pro-market and low in architectural, urban and environmental quality. Uh, in the task force, it's not possible to raise productivity by increased exploitation, increased precariousness in conditions, or firings, but only through the in in invention of new construction procedures and techniques. It is, is uh, says Pedro Arantes, which is an architect who worked with the Mutirões for, for a long time. So, the collectivization of the process spans the phases of management and work on the construction site. The past occupation reflects the appropriation of the projects by residents. This conducts uh, unfolds into an operational aimed at the strengthening of the movement through a, new, through a search for new plots of land available in the city and enrollment in public financing, financing funds for the continue, continuance of the project developed in dialogue with technical advisors. The technical advisors that develop the architectural projects and accompany their constructions are part of a chain in which the drawing is an instrument for reconnecting with the production at the worksite. This has always been a condition of the projects created by Usina, one of these technical advisors. Uh, one of the pioneering technical advisors of labor done with collective task forces. According to Mario Braga, which is one of its founders, the drawing should not be concerned with what will be made, but how it will be made. Util util utilizing constructional systems that are adapted to a reality that is less exhaustive and dangerous for the workers. So, uh, 
in, in the collective task forces, around 70% of the workforce is female. The concrete blocks commonly used as, uh, are extremely heavy, even for men. So the selection of materials are informed by the reality of people working on the project. One example of this uh, rationale is Copromo, a Copromo complex uh, which was built during the 90s, in which the installation of metallical staircases as the first stage of the construction enabled a safe transportation of material by workers, as well as serving as a vertical ruler to guide the fitting of each roll of brickwork. Um, the preeminence of women is notable, and especially strong space for empowerment is configured there. Based on this uh, women's adoption of all the aspects of production, which overlaps with struggles for autonomy in terms of gender oppression, and the discussion of the sexual division labor. In the face of the hegemonical production of the construction industry dominated by the male workforce, the presence of women in the communal task forces also represents a transformation in the lives of uh, many families. So through this analysis, it's clear uh, how this sort of experience has been attacked by the capitalist construction system. Uh, both show us the challenges and the possibilities of intervention in the construction sites, in working conditions, informing the importance of architecture as a political technology. Uh, this term, the political technology, was brought to the project by Felicity Scott's lecture in Sao Paulo last year, and it deals with architecture's ambivalent relations between control and care, um, on one side, paying attention to social, environmental, and cultural matters, on the other, being absorbed by these opaque layers of the power and the capital. Uh, so, to close, after Lelès, uh, the architect of the Sara Hospital, after his death four years ago, the factory uh, pays a slowdown eventually just handling the maintenance, the maintenance work on the buildings uh, it manufactured, uh, a, committed, a commitment that should apply to all public works. Capable, uh, he was capable of designing, producing, and constructing any type of building of, of, or urban appliance, but from 2002 on, he was forced to limit the scope of its work to do the pressure from other developers. Meanwhile, the budget for low-income housing in 2018, which impacts self-managed popular movements, was submitted to Congress to be voted on uh, with designated resources equal to zero. So uh, the movement is completely stopped since uh, last year. So this is just a start showing you two of our researchers. And Lisa will continue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to also be reading mostly um, and talking. Let's see how it goes. Um, so, like, is it this one? Yeah. So, like, um, this whole process, I mean, Brazil has changed totally in the last five years or more, uh, but especially within this process of uh, counterconduct, so the process itself of the, if in 2013 we had this 111 workers found as, with slave labor forces and the whole process of the prosecution of the construction company, this was 2013, like Carol brought up, it was like the booming moment, then we had our June Street crisis, and then we had our, our main um, global sport events, the World Cup in 2014, that's why the, the airport was being uh, extended to receive all, everyone from the planet. Uh, what changed entirely when uh, we started the project in 2016 
was a totally different country. I mean, uh, and actually during the process of this one year and a half of the research project, the were developing and building up, the country was changing. This was in April um, 2016, when we, we just had our female president re-elected, Duma. Uh, she was elected in October, November 2015, took in January, and in April, we started an, imp an impeachment pro process that end up in August, just like the same moment of the, our Olympic Games. Uh, so we had already like the new president, president, and it was really like a cope. I mean, it was a serious process. As you see, all male, white, conservative, heterosexual. Uh, I mean, everything that was there just emerged, all these different forces um, building up. And, uh, and from that on, I mean, uh, with the new, the vice president took over and uh, what started to happen was all the dismantling of very important um, uh, democratic uh, uh, processes that in the last 30 years the society was uh, really uh, building up in regards to work, to rights, and, uh, and this is still going on. So the, we ended up the project in December 2017, and this was just taking place, and it's still going on, really being dis dismantling all this process. So within the con this context, how do we take our positions, isn't it? So for us, the counterconduct was a means, I mean, in a really humble way, with our uh, possibilities from a school of architecture and with all these partnerships that Carol was bringing to how do we stand? It was really like taking a position. So when you do, so for, for every position is fatally relative to what we assume we are challenging and what we are embracing as well as that which we reject. So what do we choose? How do we position ourselves? So in that sense, and it's always in the movement, so in that sense, how do we deal with all these temporalities and specialities that are taking place locally and globally, I mean in a micro level and a macro? Uh, especially within the context of counterconduct project, we are really crossing two temporalities and two specialities. The temporality of slavery, Brazil is uh, uh, one of the main colonies uh, in the last 500 years that had the highest amount of uh, slave law, labor process. So this is still very present. Slave labor and slavery uh, shapes Brazilian history as structuring elements of society and the urban space. This was one temporality. Then the temporality of the political occurrences in our, in our history, in the country in the past decade, and then of course the specific case of the 111 workers found in conditions analogous to enslavement in the construction of the Terminal 3 of Guadalupe's International Airport. Um, and the specialities that we were dealing with was of the Guarulhos uh, municipality, which is part of this great metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. I mean, it's one of the main airports in the country. And, uh, and, uh, and the city itself, the, the people, and of course also the space, the discursive space, uh, the imaginary space with all the difficult perspectives, the different perspectives of the of this project. So we understand the, the, the counterconduct's power uh, that it was built up collectively. It's really about taking a position in this dispute over the vision of state, of the state of contemporary labor, overlapping with architecture and the construction industry, in the social political context of contemporary Brazil, and in the globalized structural context of the forms of reproducing capital. The constellation that, uh, as Carol was bringing over, uh, the project had many different layers. We had like these academic researchers, we had interventions, but what you call public interventions by artists, and then the seminars, the studies. We were building up with a really uh, broad digital platform that everything uh, was really like, it was almost like a construction site itself. So, and we were weaving all these 
different uh, perspectives. And the academic research, as like Carol was presenting, they were dealing with big issues. And we also had six uh, public interventions, as we called, and public interventions as research, as Carol brought up, that uh, were actually, um, we invited some of them, and some of them came from an open call. OK, so I stay here. Uh, and this was really important for us to mostly working with artists or group or collectives uh, from architecture but also from artistic, different artistic practices. And that helped us to look at different ways of how to deal with the work, with architecture and labor, how to deal with those uh, tough issues. And coming from the School of Architecture, where the students are not that close to the workers, or, or the way the drawings, the way the, the, it's, uh, the teaching process it doesn't really address directly without, with few exceptions, like the way Carol was bringing. So for us, when we invited these uh, public interventions by these artists or collectives, it was really important how they were addressing in different ways that would add the architectural perspectives. So actually, the first. So I'm going to introduce, present you four different public interventions we developed, and um, the first one was it is called GRU, which is the Guarulhos uh, name for international brand. Then 111, which is the number of workers that were found in this workforce labor condition, and then they call it counter cartographies, and it's really dealing with the invisibilities and visibilities, uh, focusing on the airport itself as an apparatus um, that's ruling our lives in many different ways. It's, um, it was developed by the Nucleus of Contemporary Studies in Speciality. It's a research group at, um, at the University of Sao Paulo. It's an institute of architecture and urbanism. So about like 40 People between undergraduate, graduates, and, and teachers, they developed this project along six months with many different layers. But uh, mainly, they, they focused on the Guarulhos Airport as this apparatus that functions through a strategic produ production of visibilities and invisibilities. The concept of our apparatus or dispositive that you'd say in French or in Portuguese is in the sense proposed by the philosopher Georgia Gambain from uh, Michel Foucault. NEC, which is the name of the group, uh, they took a dual approach. On one hand, they observed the behind the scenes workings of the construction of Terminal 3 of the airport and really pointing out the construction sector in Brazil is in a larger economic, political, and legal system. Drawing on to this end a diagrammatical tactic. And on the other hand, they investigated the airport as a device of what they call desubjectification, regulation and the control of bodies with a phenomenological approach. So that's the Guarulhos Airport. And uh, I mean, I'm afraid it's not really good quality, sorry for that. But uh, those are all the houses where the workers were, uh, the 111 workers were spread out. It's really close, and it's also close to the Ministry of Public, uh, the Public Ministry, uh, and, and it, then it goes to Sao Paulo. I mean, that's the main, to, to the municipality of Sao Paulo. So it's really, uh, it's showing the, the, the proximities and the, and the distances. And um, so the, the study was developed by way of counter cartographies, as understood by the coordinators, acting through unveilings, metaphors, and connections, constructed out of narratives, montages, and diagrams. So if you approach the airport as an apparatus of surveillance, or the production of visibilities and invisibilities, with the singularities of the specific case of the Air Guarulhos Airport, we also recognize this is an intrinsic modus operandi of airports uh, on a global scale as an equipment. We should highlight that the in the diagrams produced by NAC, 
the unveiling of an entire control that makes itself invisible of an economic, political, legal system. They developed a series of diagrams and maps that are really important uh, for us to unveil all these uh, games and political issues that we were discussing. So they demonstrate actually the rates of occurring slave laborers in the construction industry from 2009 to 2016. And they are mostly located on large scale works of public infrastructure in urban areas with higher concentrations of wealth in the country. Guarulhos Airport in Sao Paulo is one of the Brazil's main airports with the highest circulation in the whole Latin America. So two years before the start of the 2014 World Cup, it was privatized based on a 20 years concession to a consortium group receiving this new name and new brand as a sign of modernization of Brazil's infrastructure and part of a larger strategy of international positioning. So, in these diagrams, NAC presents the new shareholding configuration with the state, the public uh, company called Infraero, the for, that manages all the airports. Um, then the, the second one is uh, there are private Brazilian companies and that's a key and interesting part as well. It's, uh, it's Invepar, and Invepar includes the same construction company that was the OIS, and one South African company that also deals with airport management worldwide. And the third is like the pension funds by Brazilian workers, the main pension funds by Brazilian workers. So they own the airport and they run the airport. And they were actually, basically the, the same actors that were part of this uh, TAC, this term of adjustment of conduct, was the OAS, but it's of course the state again, but not the Infraero, but, but um, the, the, the public ministry. And if we had the pension funds from the, the main pension fund funds from workers, we had the workers in these slave labor conditions. So, I mean, uh, so they, they, they show all this, um, I mean, the, the, the sharing, holding positions, and then, uh, and uh, what's interesting also, what's very important to, uh, sh that we, to call attention in this situation, besides the actors being basically the same in both situations, what's visible and invisible, is uh, that they really, um, present the systemic relationship between building contractors and the state. And as they, I'm gonna quote one part of the text. In the case of GRU, it's a matter of evidence. The same company participates in similarly contrasting enterprises. On the one hand, it's capable of operating a logistics of workforce recruitment and utilization of slave labor conditions on the construction site by way of middlemen and on the other, managing the entire airport complex, responding to international standards of security and aviation operation by way of Invepar, the, co the company. This dual phase of the same company's operations puts in check the common view that there was a fortuitous lack of control on the work site in the context of the operation of the same airport that should be governed by high levels of reli reliability. The fact indicates that the company's way of operating actually responds to the maximum efficiency of the enterprise, finding greater earnings case by case. And, uh, and uh, so they develop a series of maps. We have the publication that it's gonna be at the exhibition site outside, which, and also it's on the website, the whole book. Um, showing in very detailed ways uh, what happened, and this happened in the whole country actually, and it's a very recent phenomenon. And, uh, and I think it's an ambiguity we're dealing with, not only Brazil, but uh, many other lo situations, locations, and how do we position ourselves within that and the different actors. Uh, and then what's the role of the state, the company, how do we, uh, how to deal with that? So those are all the, the, from 2009 to 2016, uh, if you look at, 
uh, the, all the, these major infrastructures, from many habitations to infrastructure, education, culture, and services and commerce, be the main uh, public and private uh, institutions, they all have had uh, slavery conditions in the working sites. Um, so they, we, we, they were able to map out and to show and give visibility to this. And most of them were from the government, uh, government infrastructure projects. And uh, another important uh, process that it was mapped out was about, as Carol was also mentioning, was about the slave labor um, understanding. It's very recent. And then all the dismantling that's going on uh, and, uh, and the fights about the discursive level and actually the practical, I mean, because this is within the Congress. Actually, the convergence of the state and private companies is a structure in Brazil, urban development, which consolidated with the country's large-scale public work of infrastructure, starting mainly with the construction of Brasilia, also including um, many other big projects. Uh, we'll talk about Minha Casa Minha Vida, uh, really huge hydroelectric dams, and, um, and they all with this impetus for modernization and developmentalist to the intensification of, in the exploitation of the workforce and the dilapidation of nature. I have to run. Yeah. So, um, that's the, around the Guarulhos Airport. What is very important in regards to slavery that we were discussing, it's uh, the degrading work conditions and slave labor conditions present within this condition, it's actually not an exception. Uh, it's a recurring situation that is common all over the country and, um, and, uh, and it's a, a very key and important situation that is dealing with the structure infra citizenship. These are the conditions for most of these workers and many, and many others and it's uh, really a battle within the country uh, between this elite and um, uh, and most of the population. So I go really quickly now. Um, the three other projects, this one is by Raquel Garbelotti. It's outside, it's one of the movies, it's an artwork that she developed. She built up a modest scale of the two of the houses that the workers were staying. And she, and she worked with the light conditions and the sound uh, because it was one way that, the, that they could <laughs> that the, minister, the public ministry could uh, argue about the, um, the slave laid for conditions that was, there was no light, and then she really investigates how it is as, a, as an environment and really getting closer to what they experienced. So what was really important is about the experience of, this, uh, of the workers in many different ways. Another artist, Vania Medeiros, she worked with uh, seven construction workers, not directly that was the, the ones on the site, but uh, that she invited to work with them, for them to draw uh, about their own work conditions. And, uh, and it was a process that was very beautiful because it's really bringing back this political power of the drawing that it has been taken out, as Carol was also mentioning. You see, I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and it's also a book that we also brought, and, uh, and it was really beautiful. They joined us. Uh, I mean, it was a, uh, very strong how this could be broadened up as a way of, uh, as a political statement, as political position of who takes the control, or actually who takes the power to imagine in different ways. Uh, another beautiful project is by uh, two young uh, women and, um, and they formed a collective, another collective, and they drove all the way to Petrolândia to meet the workers and they spent a long time with them and really bringing b back their own language, their own perspectives, which is really critical very political as well, and they brought their voices and their way of seeing all this process, and they built up like a vocabulary of these main words. It's really beautiful. In the book, it's also translated into English, 
Uh, it's a very unique language, very singular uh, and very precise. And what they did, as in this kind of uh, getting to other ideological circuits, they insert 111 posters of this words in this uh, in the at the terminal tree at the airport in April and May last year uh, in the carriage bag when you arrive so it was like how do you bring these different voices and how do we meet uh, as consumers of at the airport and um, so sort of very strong and at the same time subtle way of intersecting these different uh, voices and experiences. And finally, uh, another way of working for us was uh, also built by the Vitor Cesar, the artist with uh, other students from different universities. We built up a mobile base that was in Sao Paulo, also in Guarulhos and other places. That was also bringing to different hands and, and, and voices and positions that built up this uh, structure that was a place for um, for dialogues, for meetings, they went to different public squares, different places, uh, bringing all the different voices from the project through this uh, structure and, and activating different ways. So it's actually, there were more like smaller scale um, interventions that were really important for us to, to build up this public realm uh, to bring out these discussions and debates, and they're going to continue actually, um, and they continue today as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, um, Carolyn Leisure. Uh, I'm just going to introduce, we've now um, got two shorter talks paired together um, and I'll introduce each as we go um, and then we'll have a break and come back and ask questions afterwards. It's a really sort of intense journey to Brazil. So uh, that was amazing. And um, our next speaker is Adam Kasa. Um, Adam's projects consider the cultures and politics of the city, foregrounding inequalities and the role of history, architecture and design. He co-founded and directed Theatrum Mundi, uh, an international research centre on urban culture and is currently a senior tutor in architecture at the Royal College of Art. And his current project examines the history of the tabula rasa in urban planning and pedagogy and theorises cohabitation as an alternative design ethic. So welcome to Adam. Oh, yeah. Great. I'm on here somewhere. Oops. Uh, there. Okay, cool. Great. I hope that's spelled right. Yeah, okay. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. So I'm Adam Kaz. I'm at the RCA. And uh, thank you to Mel for inviting me here and for the opportunity to do some thinking around this, um, this topic. And thank you, Ligia and Carol, for a great opening. I actually think there's going to be some nice connections, um, though a very different talk, but some nice connections with yours. Um, also, for anyone who works better with text, this link just links to my script. So if you want to download it and follow along, I'll have this up for a little while um, if you want to have a look at that. So, I'm interested in the question of, of labor and social inequality as it touches the built environment, built environment practices and professionals, finances, and spatial arguments. And originally today, I thought I would speak more literally about the labor of architects or perhaps architectural laboring in terms of the profession itself, in relation to construction labor locally or abroad, or perhaps the topic of professional memberships or accreditation or lobby groups or the union. But luckily, I think we have colleagues here who are going to speak to that more directly. But recently, I've been, as I've been laboring on this paper, my attention shifted from these topical considerations uh, about the professional landscape or about a near automated future to labor more broadly conceived. And so what follows is a thesis, is not a thesis that I've come to uh, over some years of thought or research but rather I just come to you with a thought experiment that's only just beginning to share and hopefully engage in dialogue. So that's my caveat. 
Um, and so to, to begin, as any good student from the humanities or social sciences, I turned to the Oxford English Dictionary to define labor. So unsurprisingly, the first definition we come across is a familiar one. Labor as, quote, an instance of physical or mental exertion, a piece of work that has been or is to be performed, a task. The second, let me see if I have this right. Yeah, okay, good. The second uh, introduces labor's other ever-present meaning. Uh, bodily or mental exertion, particularly when difficult, painful, or compulsory. Work, toil. Here is not a definition of labor's benevolence, of its Protestant sainthood, nor its enduring normative claim repeated by any number of mostly male scholars repositioning craft, or in one well-known scholar of craft's words, quote, an enduring basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. But rather labor as difficult, painful, compulsory. Or as the third definition from the OED, now obsolete in use, quotes, hardship, suffering, pain, distress. It's no surprise then that etymologically it entered into language in the English language through the Anglo-Norman and Old French in the first half of the 12th century as trouble, affliction, misfortune. Later as hard work, burden, or task, and only in the early 15th century aligned with the body of an unskilled worker as a laborer. And so therein in the development of the use of the word, the embedded history of it as suffering, pain, and distress, later embodied in the worker, agricultural at first, and later industrial in certain geographically bound histories like this country. It's in the 19th century that the word is first becomes used to express a collective. As workers considered collectively, especially as a social group or political force. In the UK, acts like the Combinations uh, Act of 1799 or 1800, 1824 and 1825, made it illegal for combinations, that is literally people combining together to combine forces, to press for wage, increase, uh, uh, wage increases or to change work, working hours. This wasn't decriminalized in this country until 1867 and only legalized with the Trade Union Act of 1871. And here's some text from the, early, uh, the earliest act. Every workman who shall at any time after the passing of this act enter into any combination to obtain an advance of wages or to lessen or alter the hours or duration of the time of working or to decrease the quantity of work shall, uh, well, there's a lot more text here, but shall be committed and, to, and confined into the common jail. And it goes on. For the more effectual suppression of all combinations amongst journeymen, workmen, and other persons employed in any manufacture, trade, or business, be it further enacted that all and every person and person whomsoever, whether employed in any such manufacture, trade, or business, or not, who shall attend any meeting held or held for the purpose of making or entering into any contract, covenant, or agreement, by this act declared to be illegal, or of entering into, supporting, maintaining, continuing, or carrying on any combination for the purpose by this act declared to be illegal, or, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, shall be put into a house of correction or go to jail. I started to read this in full because I think it's important to remember the relationship between law and labor, something that I think comes out really nicely in our earlier presentation, and the very real relationship between the construction of labor through recourse to acts of criminalization. For example, criminalizing trespass in the commons or criminalizing, criminalizing combination or collective, bargain, collective bargaining. So just to bring us through where we're at so far, or where I'm at so far, and maybe you're with me, labor's etymology is trouble, affliction, misfortune, hardship, suffering, pain, and distress. Labor is a term for task comes later, as an embodied identity even later, and as a political collective later still. And in this last iteration of the term, 
in this country, there's a long history of law specifically written to prevent workers from combining to relieve this hardship, pain, or distress of their conditions. And there's a history of criminalization in the construction of the laboring subject. Okay, so now with this in mind, and bear with me, I move to a next part of the task of the talk, and it might seem like a leap, but hopefully we'll come around at the end. One of the pleasures of teaching is being taught by your students. And at the RCA, I lead a new master's in research program uh, that's a 12-month program like many here in the UK. And right now, the students are working on their group project. A group project that has a small brief, but then is meant for them to be self-initiated, self-defined, and self-directed. The brief was called After the Creative City and situates itself in the continuing dialogue about the instrumentation of culture for urban regeneration projects. The site that they've chosen to look at is in Herringay in North London, and specifically a juxtaposition of two sites. A controversial and long standstill of the Seven Sisters or Ward's Corner Regeneration Project on the one hand, and a new pilot study for a new creative enterprise zone, a new policy coming out of the mayor's office around Tottenham. These two sites are less than 500 meters away. One works to draw creative or cultural industry or labor to the area, the creative enterprise zone. The other is at a standstill because at the heart of the redevelopment it would, that would see new private homes constructed is the removal and temporary relocation of the largely Latin American, but also home to traders of over 21 nationalities, market. One would see the promotion of a certain kind of culture, and the other would result in the erasure of another kind. What was most fascinating to me when the students were presenting early work was the prospect of the market's closure, was that the prospect of the market's closure prompted a report from the United Nations uh, in the Human Rights Department. And a collection of special experts uh, studied the area and started the contestation and argued that the gentrification of this area represents a threat to cultural life. And they go on. If granted, the compulsory purchase order under review would result in the expulsion of current residents and shop owners from the place where they live and earn their livelihoods and would have a deleterious impact on the dynamic cultural life of the diverse people in the area. The regeneration project, this is still their words, would force their activities to stop or relocate this has a disproportionate impact on people belonging to minorities and their right to equal participation in economic, social, and cultural life. We're concerned that despite the continuous engagement of the civil society coalition around the site, no suitable alternative to expulsion and the destruction of the market has been identified or meaningfully discussed with the affected people. In addition to the duty of the state to protect individuals from violations of their human rights by third parties, all business enterprises have an independent responsibility to respect all internationally recognized human rights and address averse human rights impacts." End quote. So if we are to take the UN Human Rights Experts Report as evidence, that there's a suggestion that the regeneration of Seven Sisters will have a dis disproportionate impact on people belonging to minorities and their right to equal participation in economic, social, and cultural life. Then I wondered the, the, the next thought. And of course, it's entirely hypothetical in nature. If an ethnic minority group has the prospect of being disproportionately affected in a negative way, and if this information is now public through a UN report, and if the developers of this site, Granger PLC in this case, move ahead with the development in any case, might there be a claim to accuse them of a hate crime? So we need to know something about hate crime legislation in the UK to go any further, and perhaps specifically about England and Wales, because it differs in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. So according to a brief put out by Amnesty International the UK, after a spike of hate crimes in this country, about two weeks before and after the 2016 referendum on Brexit, uh, England and Wales, a hate crime is defined as, quote, any hate incident which constitutes a criminal offense perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated by hostility or prejudice. 
hate crime legislation in the UK, or sorry, in England and Wales, has a timeline that begins with the Public Order Act in 1986 that created 17 new offenses for stirring up racial hatred through threatening or abusive words, behaviors, or written materials. Later provisions in this were added in 2006, uh, sorry, for religious identity in 2006 and sexual orientation in 2008. There was the Crime and Disorder Act in 1998, which uh, added, um, well, you can read it here, but I'll say it, <laughs> which created offenses for racially ag aggravated assault, criminal damage, and public order harassment. So the first was for stirring up racial hate. This is for actually aggravated actions. And later, in the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act of 2001, religious aggravated assaults were added. And finally, the other set of laws that pertain to hate crime in this country is the Criminal Justice Act of 2003, where in Section 145, racial aggravation was applicable to all offenses in, in criminal law. And in Section 146, it allowed for sentencing enhancement provision for any aggravated hostility towards sexual orientation or disability. And lastly, in 2012, so very recently, under the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act, the same legal provision was added and extended to transgender identity. So we have a, a long history over the last four decades or five decades from racial incitement of hatred to aggravated offenses still with racial and, um, and religious and later uh, sexual orientation, disability, and transgender identity. And these are the five monitored strands of identity, and identity is important to hold on to here, that are used to identify hate crime in England and Wales. Race, religion, gender identity, sexuality, and disability. To give a sense of scale, in 2015 to 16, some 62,518 cases of hate crime were officially reported in England and Wales. A separate crime survey of England, which isn't the official police statistics, put that up at around 220,000. So a huge underreporting, which isn't, which isn't surprising. According to the most recent report from the Home Office, in 2016-17, that rose by 29%, the largest rise on record since uh, recordings began in 2011 and 12, to over 80,000. And this they attributed to, quote, a genuine rise in hate crime around the time of the EU referendum, and also due to ongoing improvements of recording by police, so trying to get at that underreporting. But further down in the Home Office's report was the following, that hate crime policy and legislation takes a, quote, human rights approach that covers majority as well as minority groups. So let's remember here back to the intervention in our site in Haringey by the UN human rights experts. And next they go on to write that, do I have this here? No, okay. Next they go on to write that, quote, an offense may be motivated by hatred towards a characteristic that is not centrally monitored. So it doesn't need to be one of these five monitored conditions um, that could be part of this, uh, this, this hate crime. So they include, well, it could be about age or it could be about uh, any number of other characteristics. The five monitored are the main ones, but the Home Office suggests there's space for interpretation. And actually, if you go back to the Amnesty International briefing, in England and Wales, it's down to the police. So in that report, the police forces are permitted to record other forms of targeted hostility as hate crime, in addition to the five monitored strands. So for example, in England and Wales, police have started to include categories like alternative subcultures that aren't captured by any of those five, uh, misogyny, and sex workers. OK. So, so far, so good. So now with hate crime legislation, it's uh, the longest standing identitarian category is based on race and ethnicity. The Home Office policy and legislation of hate crimes takes a human rights approach. And police in England and Wales are free to identify other forms of targeted hostility. And here we might want to think, in addition to ethnicity, what about hostility towards tendency? towards perceived rental value, aesthetic stigma, or perhaps class. So 
So the case for a hypothetical charge of a hate crime against a developer in London sees it, seems at least so far plausible. So I return to my original question. Is gentrification then, in a broad sense, insofar as the 60 years of scholarship overwhelmingly underscores its adverse social, economic, and cultural effects on race, gendered, queer, and class bodies and cities, a hate crime? There are a number of elements to consider this question, but I want to focus on two. First, we need to know what a crime is. So in the definition of hate crime, crime here is defined by assault with injury, assault without injury, harassment, public fear, alarm or distress, or other criminal damage. This is mostly related to property, dwellings, buildings, and vehicles. And in that case of property, the property owner. So where is the crime in closing a market? How do we start to think about economic violence as crime? Is it possible to do so in the buying and selling of property and the setting of rental prices are not criminal? Second, in criminal law, there's a victim, usually, and a perpetrator, usually. Here, and especially in hate crime legislation, uh, uh, in our hypothetical, the victim might be a collective, a group, self-identified. And, and that's not out of the question given the history of class action lawsuits. But defining the victim becomes harder and harder. Is it the 55% of Latin American or Hispanic business owners of the market? Does it include the other 21 nationalities of traders in the market? Does it include those impacted by the economic, social, and cultural support structures the market hosts? Where does its impact end? Who's a victim of closing the market? In hate crimes, there's an understanding of its structural and social impact that a crime against one member of a community or identity, uh, identitarian identity might incite fear or anxiety against others identifying in the same group. But the process here is different because the question of regeneration's impact necessarily transgresses, transgresses identitarian politics. Second, who's the perpetrator? Would it, hypothetically, be Granger PLC, the current developer in discussion? Would we hold the company to account? Individuals in the company to account? Or would it be Herringy's Council's planning department who's approving the measure? Or the housing target numbers dictated by the GLA or central government to which they're trying to attain to avoid, uh, to avoid um, other things that can happen when you don't meet your housing target? Or is it the 2011 Localism Act? Or is it people who would have bought flats in the development? Or is it a chain grocery store who would take out a 20 plus year lease on a large floor plate to meet increased rental retail profits and council business rates? So who's the perpetrator? There's a long legacy in queer and POC scholarship working towards prison abolition and the defunding of police who articulate that while hate crime legislation may give visibility to moments of extreme violence motivated by sentiments against someone's perceived identity, that the answer to this violence cannot be the increasing of policing in these communities, nor the increase of criminalization and incarceration. Radical queer politics reminds us of the statistics that, to quote the queer legal scholar Dean Spade, I wonder if I have it here, yeah. Jails and prisons are not full of dangerous people. They are full of people of color, poor people, and people with disabilities. Spade goes on, more than 60% of people, at least in US prisons, are people of color. Every stage and aspect of the criminal punishment and immigration enforcement systems is racist. And so there's a contradiction at the heart of counter hate crime scholarship from marginalized communities and scholars invested in them around the desire for recognition, something hate crime legislation gives to minority groups within a dominant system, and as late in this country, 2012, in the case of transgender identity, within a system that perpetually and historically continues to oppress these same, uh, these same people. So hate crime legislation against race by a criminal justice system that is itself racist. The second thing that hate crime legislation does is it identifies hatred as embodied in an individual. And this comes back to who is the perpetrator, rather than addressing its systemic and embedded structure 
in even those systems that aim to work to ameliorating those conditions. In opposition to hate crime legislation, Spade and others uh, in, in a book series called Against Equality that looks at uh, marriage, it looks at uh, hate crime legislation and, and other kind of uh, liberal politic procedures, uh, especially around gay and lesbian identitarian politics. Um, think about things like, uh, and, and Dean's uh, Spade's looking particularly at kind of uh, disaggregated queer and trans experience, uh, working directly to support the survival of queer and trans people who are vulnerable to violence and not engaging the police. Dismantling, uh, some dismantling work to dismantle systems that put queer and trans people into such dangerous and violent situations. So stop building new jails and immigration prisons. Decriminalize sex work and drugs and stop the expansion of surveillance systems. And beginning to build alternatives away from the false promise of safety from an industrial prison complex. So then, confronting the systemic nature of gentrification and its systemic violence with the false promise of hate crime legislation, is it even actually possible? And if possible, is it something that we actually desire? Is this a line of thought that we can actually go down? Who would we prosecute? And this leads me to the final coda of the talk, thinking around the systemic notion of criminalizing capital. So how do we think of labor, the first part of this talk, and gentrification, the second part, and identitarian or criminal aspects of holding people to account within a legal system that we have at our disposal. We all know that currently there's a strike going on in higher education to do with a number of issues, but primarily pensions. At stake is a structural reorganization of the university's superannuation scheme, or USS, leaving thousands of higher education workers in this country worse off. Pensions are incredibly valuable resources, as you kind of mentioned as well, the pensions that are invested in the construction industry, fought for over decades and decades of continued legal confrontation with the rights of people to collectively bargain as laborers. But a pension fund is capital. It's also money. And capital needs to be invested. And investment is directed towards a number of possible outputs. You can go on USS website and a cursory glance at its private equity investments show that among the hundreds of multinational corporations, banks, hedge funds, and public companies it's invested in, it's also invested in land securities, one of the UK's largest commercial property developers, in Barrett Homes, one of the UK's largest housing developers, and Taylor Wimpy, one of the, another of the UK's largest housing developers, all of which have been involved in very controversial development projects in this city and across the country. So the very pensions of my labor and of my colleagues' labor here, some of who might be in the room, some who are speaking today or tomorrow, doing research on architecture and capital, are literally invested in the reorganization of the structures of the cities in which we work. This isn't the moment where we throw up our hands and say there's no way out. Hopefully we end on a positive here. <laughs> that is not very positive. But it's possibly to raise the question that capitalism itself as a structure of organization and of extractive quality of, of labor, which is required to make these profits that you so, so rightly put to in the Brazilian case, is a hate crime. That labor, is fu that labor itself as a category is, the in, is a fundamental uh, condition of inequality. And that the systems and institutions that shore up capitalism's persist persistent tendrils including hate crime legislation, or even the neoliberal university, are not the ones that might make our, our cities or us uh, different in the future. And so that's why events like today are so important for us to come together and think and theorize and imagine alternatives. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adam. I um, hope Alex is getting his brain in order for this discussion. It's fantastically rich. Um, so finally, our last short talk, um, Concrete Action. Um, since 2015, Concrete Action Collective has been working towards a more ethical and transparent practice of architecture through providing a secure route for the release of privately held information ConcreteAction.net connects professionals working in the fields of urban design, planning and architecture with community groups and activists fighting for social housing and public land in London. 
Um, and um, we welcome two speakers up to talk. Thank you very much. One for now. <laughs> yeah, one at a time. That's just the way it is. Okay, good. So, hi everyone. Um, actually, I'm quite happy to be following on from that note. Um, uh, because I'm going to talk about the kind of process that Concrete Action has been through in terms of defining how we, um, of, uh, in terms of like defining our own labor um, within the sphere of architecture. So um, for those of people who don't know, Concrete Action um, was set up in 2015 by a group of people who were not only architecturally trained, but also technologists, journalists, um, and other sort of related built environment people um, in response to the changing urban landscape within London. Um, so in response to estate regeneration, primarily. Um, and actually, we first launched as a uh, whistleblowing site. Um, and so, you know, what, um, we got some interesting results from the press. Um, what is actually Concrete Action then? Um, we're obviously involved in the dark web. We're dissidents, um, can't be trusted. And, um, you know, I mean, you can see it, see it for yourself. Uh, even the Evening Standard got involved. Um, and, well, actually, we're not actually a dark website, but maybe what we created was inadvertently um, what Stefan Duncombe calls like an ethical spectacle. So a symbolic action that shifts, seeks to shift the culture of a way of working towards more progressive values. Um, so shifting the way we practice within architecture or how we position ourselves within what's happening at the moment. So participatory, um, seeking to empower participants and spectators alike, um, open, responsive and adaptive to shifting contexts and the ideas of participants, transparent, um, realistic, using fantasy to illuminate and dramatize real world, real world power dynamics and social relations that otherwise tend to remain hidden in plain sight and utopian, which is celebrating the impossible and therefore helping to make the impossible possible. Um, but actually, the leaks, I don't know how much of that you can see, but actually the leaks were initiated because of the way in which development and the planning system in, in the UK works, means that um, the residents of estates actually the people who find out last what is going on. So we know sort of as architects, as people working within architecture and development that, you know, after a project is initiated, you might be working on it for a year, a year and a half, two years, even before anyone who might already be living on that site gets an idea of what's going on. So this is a kind of timeline of procurement and you get up to here before you get the community consultation, which is sort of over halfway towards the end um, of the project. So we thought that um, leaks might be a sort of good way to start to disrupt that um, because there must be lots of people out there who are uncomfortable with this way of working, um, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, who are involved as architects or designers and have access to all this information over years and, or at least or months of design development and they're gonna to wanna to send it to us so that we can send it to all the people who are out there who want to know what is going on. Um, so, uh, and I'm not gonna say whether that was successful or not, but um, you have these extremely long time scales of development and then um, when you get to the actual moment when you're allowed to comment as a, as an, as a resident, um, you end up with this which is really opaque and unsatisfactory process of filling in a form and saying like, uh, yes or no. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the ladder of participation, which is a scale of citizen involvement developed in the States by Sherry Arnstein. And uh, this kind of 
sits on le between level three and four, so where the authority asks for the community's opinions and says they will be taken into consideration, but the community has no way of making sure its priorities are stuck to, um, and the authority decides what it is willing to consult on and leaves the biggest issues out, and residents have no way of speaking back. Um, so after we launched the website, we had an open window into the housing crisis in London, which looked like this. Um, it was quite overwhelming. We had tons and tons of emails, and it wasn't architects who were emailing us, it was residents, it was people on the ground saying like, hey, we heard you're architects, you, you know what's going on, I live here, we've got this thing happening, can you help us? Um, can you come and work for us? Can you tell us what's going on? We don't understand, we don't want this to happen, can, like, stop. <laughs> How do we help, how do we make this stop? And um, or we were like actually completely overwhelmed by all of this information because, you know, the last thing you really want is a window into the housing crisis. <laughs> so, um, so, and it also, I mean, it gave us a good idea of what the scale of the problem is. Like, as, as built environment professionals, like, this, there's an awful lot of people out there who are really invested in what is going on because it directly affects where they live. It's their house. It's their life. And that's one of the things that relates back to what the other two people you were saying earlier is that um, the, uh, there's a sort of, um, there's something that's not actually talked about that much, which is the level of uncertainty that it puts you under when you don't understand what is going on. Um, and when you feel like you're in the middle of this governmental process where it's your house um, that has been given a question mark over the top of it and you have no control over what is actually going to happen next. Um, so, so getting back to actually um, what's going on, um, and who has the power in this situation, which is kind of demonstrated in this map here, and starts to get back to the original point of today, which is the relationship between the finance and how we actually work. And this shows um, the different developers that are involved in um, regenerating different areas of London. Um, and actually, when it comes down to it, uh, it's not actually... Um, that's interesting. Yeah, so the, there's this, the, the system is um, effectively broken and concrete action is coming in from the side to try and change the way that this, that this kind of system is processing the built environment. Um, and the other thing that we found out is also that it's not really, it's not actually the design of people's homes that they're complaining about, it's, it's the management. And uh, that's partly what uh, this was about, is that there's this, the system also works through the media and the way, that the, the way that regeneration is displayed in the media as a positive or a negative, or the way that the existing built environment is displayed as, or portrayed as something negative that needs to be regenerated. Um, and then you come on to also gentrification, like what you were saying, like how, um, and past examples where um, people have actually won um, the battle against um, the demolition, but they haven't won the battle against gentrification because you know the people still come in and um, change what's going on. So what do we actually do um, apart from being a common duet for information, um, which is kind of like a passive, not really an active mode of of being, um, and definitely not very concrete. Um, so we're working towards different forms of ethical practice, and this, so this is partly this sort of journey where we so we had this window into the housing crisis, and then, um, and then we were kind of like, oh, now we've got to do something. Um, so uh, looking at from within architecture, how can you empower people to know better what's going on and to be able to re react to that? Um, so this is like the original diagram where we had. Um, sort of internet technology and anonymity experts getting legal advice on whistleblowing, um, existing campaigns in London like 35% who are active in Elephant and Castle, um, Focus E15 which are active in um, Newham, um, Crescent Gardens in Brixton um, and other umbrella groups providing support like Just Space that are based out of 
UCL and um, UCL Engineering Exchange, and then this professional network of like architects and planners and sympathetic developers, which there are some actually existing. So um, we were looking at how all these people interconnect and trying to switch the focus. So like, who is your client in this process? Well, the client is the residents, right? Um, instead of the attitude from the architectural establishment, which is the client is the person who's paying you the money. Um, and when did that actually, at what point in this process did that switch? Or has it always been the case? Um, and so, uh, this sort of process of empower empowerment and knowledge transfer, because obviously us within our professional sphere, we have access to a lot of information and we kind of know where to find it. Um, like where to find building regulations, for example, or how to read them um, is something that we're, we would all be relatively familiar with. So we started asking ourselves that like, how do you access information um, and can we sort of can we sort of translate or give that to people so that they can actually start to get more involved in the process. Um, so the, one of the first things we did was trying to explain the planning process so that people who emailed us when they were saying, where am I? I don't understand what's gonna happen next. Um, they could kind of position themselves along this timeline and work out what, what would be the best course of action to take in that situation. Um, you can download this from our website still, by the way, if you want to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and mostly our answer was also we don't really know where you, where you are and you're going to have to find out who else is involved in the project and, you, and um, see if they would talk to you or even send us information about, about what's going on. So the other thing we were doing is this sort of process of trying to increase transparency and in encouraging people who know what's going on to release information. Um, this is one of our adverts. What can you do? You can leak us information. Um, and um, in fact, we found a really inspiring whistleblower in the form of um, Brian Anson and the ARC, who were involved in um, the campaign to save Covent Garden in the 1970s. Um, so I'm just going to play like. Is that right? I might have got all this in the wrong order. I think there's three more pages. Wait, let me see. It's not going to work now. Is that true? Yes. We started to before I go before I go on to Brian Anson. I'm actually just going to finish this bit. Um, uh, so yeah, we started this process of kind of untangling, and actually, um, this is uh, this was kind of this was kind of the attitude that we felt like the architectural profession had when we started, which was just like, ah, oh, there's this housing crisis. Help! What are we going to do? We don't know what to do. Don't know what to do. Um, panic. Um, complete paralysis. Uh, well, let's just carry on doing what we always do, and um, and not much really changed. Um, and uh, and so. In our process of, of sort of working out how we're going to react to this, we also we sort of doing research. Um, this is a magazine called Us, or Architects for a Really Socialist Environment, um, or whatever you want to call us. And so we've discovered like a whole bunch of people, in, like Us and. Um, and the ARC in Brian Anson, and they feel like there's also this kind of um, collective amnesia about things that happened um, in the past regarding um, similar practices. So here's, this is a tiny clip about... We've got radical architectural students operating under the guise of the Architects Revolutionary Council announced their presence to the world, staging a dramatic press conference and publishing an inflammatory manifesto which called for the destruction of the RIBA and the establishment of an international movement towards community architecture. The ARC emerged from a unit at the AA run by Brian Anson and defined themselves as architectural revolutionaries. Their manifesto stated that when words such as destroy, enemy, and overthrow are employed, 
they are met. We wish to create a situation whereby every time a student passes a building such as center point he vows that he or she will never work in a practice that is involved in such obscenities. Whenever a student walks through a gentrified area where massive improvement grants have enabled landlords to evict long-standing tenants and raise the value of their property a hundredfold, he or she will vow never to work in firms that indulge in such activities. So now I'm going to pass on to Charlotte. Hi, thanks. Oh, do I need to go back? Uh, yeah. Hold on. Do you need a shortcut? Smart. Mm. And a Mac. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, a lot of the work we do is in quite a lot of different strands. So, the, we're basically just going through a few of the strands rather than kind of making a big arc or we'll try and like round it up or in the discussion maybe later. Um, I guess we were starting to work on kind of like, uh, yeah, like grassroots kind of community engagement and things like this. Um, and then I guess we started obviously thinking about how to engage other architects or other people in the built environment into that and the limits and the difficulties about doing so. Um, and we also kind of noticed these kind of, you know, cute enclaves of good work that are built up from, you know, uh, t trust funds to, um, you know, com different kind of conditions. Um, and also kind of the, a like the alienating uh, quality of certain uh, uh, architects or activist groups, um, whilst we empathise with both aspects of these kind of enclaves, right? There's something not quite working in terms of engagement. Uh, and uh, I guess we didn't want to kind of be one of these trophy kind of cute um, projects as such. And we also didn't want to just be kind of aggy. So we're trying to work out modes of engagement in that way. Um, I guess part of like the, our own social reproduction, right? We reproduce ourselves as a left project. We reproduce ourselves as architects and trying to, trying to just admit that that's part of it. Um, I guess these two, two uh, uh, quotes from this uh, article kind of sum up maybe a bridge in our, in like a, a kind of moving point in our work. Um, I don't think ethics and architecture go together. We have a history of being sycophantics. People give us jobs. Fair enough. Um, and if we don't do the work, someone else will, so we'll try to do it better. Yeah, another one, kind of trope phrases that you can empathize with, but you know, is what we're dealing with when we're trying to like, you know, build or expand kind of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Also, um, I'll kind of keep uh, quick on this. There's also the larger kind of intellectual crisis with um, from uh, Tafuri back in the 70s, who kind of more or less said in the introduction to the republication of uh, architecture and utopia, if you want to do good, do something else. Um, it's really not much longer than that, the sentence, but uh, it's a bit longer. I think he says, be an economist. Um, uh, so yeah, and obviously we will hear, and uh, across the whole symposium, we'll hear um, an elaboration of um, uh, work by Peggy Dima on the architect's work, etc. It's just kind of around, so I put it in, but we, we know this bits. Um, so yeah, I guess there's also a climate of uh, kind of recent uh, unionization and new forms of precarity and responses to that, especially in London that we were really kind of inspired by and a lot of kind of friends or comrades or whatever on other areas of the left are kind of working in and getting real results. So we've got the IWGB and United Voices of the World who um, have made real wins for um, either new or old forms of pre precarious workers. So you've got outsourced uh, cleaners in academic institutions. You've got delivery workers. Um, so with bosses who are basically algorithms, like your boss is an algorithm and you don't have an office and you're totally de like disparate across the city. So new kind of structures to help these workers and new forms of organ organizing throughout the city. Uh, the artists' union, am I reverberating a lot or is it just me? Oh, okay, sorry, I just hear myself, it's intense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then artists' union England as well, okay, trying to work out how creative labor can engage with these things. And also some of my favorites, ACORN, Renters Union, and uh, things, actions like the rent strike in the past couple of years. Um, I don't know if many people know about uh, ACORN, it's kind of the past few months, but um, built in Bristol, I mean, to apply to London's quite difficult, but um, 
yeah, basically renters' union that have been winning and like getting deposits back from landlords and picketing real estate um, uh, estate agents and things like this, and the university rent strikes, etc. So there's kind of been like appetite on other areas of the left, basically growing. Uh, and, and feeling like actually that's something that maybe we do want to speak about. And um, then we found, uh, yeah, architectural workers. Um, some of you might know. Um, they're uh, an organization uh, who looks specifically into kind of like labor conditions and um, architects role in the housing crisis, et cetera, et cetera. They've done many events and they were. Um, developing an, an ongoing project, um, which is a workers' inquiry of over 100 people and their experience of practice, to give kind of weight and nuance to the uh, possibility of kind of collective organization in the future and trying to understand exactly what people are going through today. Um, they've also organized debates between residents, active groups, academics, or architects in one place, so trying to break through these enclaves that we're speaking about. And we had basically collective ideas, collective demands, collective ways we wanted to work, strategy, rig rigor. So, yeah, we are really tight now. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and we also knew of all these examples, right? Like most of us have done some kind of dissertation project here and there that kind of like mused about all these kind of heroes of where, whatever time in the past 50 years where conditions were better, they were squatting, they had better rent, it was like, seems sunnier or something, those cultural moments of, you know, uh, not to kind of negate those conditions where they still did kind of quite radical work, but we kind of heard about all these things that were so great and we just wanted to, to know more about them and situate ourselves within that really, um, not as a kind of ego trip, but as a, as a historical and political act to situate this moment in a line of other projects and through that kind of begin to instrument, instrumentalize these things rather than just kind of um, reinventing the wheel, maybe. Jumping on to newer ideas too fast. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all these things kind of floating around. And so we um, found, uh, well, we already knew and were also friends with, uh, where is this? Oh yeah, Mayday Rooms, which is a social uh, movements archive and meeting space and union offices on Fleet Street. Um, who, yeah, so they basically have one of the, far, like one of the only kind of uh, archives in the world of social movements, which is d developing and undergoing and quite, quite new, really. And so we'd been wanting to work with them for a while, and we um, uh, basically decided to kind of create the kind of built environment or architect's wing, I guess, of this archive, and to bring all these things in one place. It's an excuse to find all these people we'd kind of wrote dissertations at a distance about um, and kind of hear how they thought about today, uh, what they thought about then, the things they learned, um, an oral history project, right? So that, again, as we said, it's kind of a political act to do that. It's not necessarily just collating from the past, but it's providing a new kind of situation in which you might operate in the future. Um, yeah, on top of that, with Mayday, we talk a lot about professional, like professionalism and anti-professionalism, but in a kind of useful way, intellectualism with social work. And, and how that relates to both left and artistic disciplines and professional disciplines and all these things. So it was all kind of match made in heaven. So, um, yeah, so we did this thing, which I did do an uglier version really at the start, but I did this over lunch today. <laughs> All my fellow speakers know that. I made it look a bit neater. Um, but yeah, a timeline of kind of the architectural organizations or collectives or attempts to unionize for the past 50 years. Um, and we started kind of following through and kind of trying to find key figures in this, uh, of these, uh, of these periods and kind of set up kind of a certain set of structured questions that we would ask them. Um, so yeah, can you see that? Yeah. So kind of context, uh, what kind of led you to act? I think it's a key question. There's quite a lot of questions here and some we left out, but let's say, yeah, what was the moment that led you to act and what kind of contextual, what was your context at the time? Um, what were the practicalities? How did this structure work? How did you meet? Um, how did that happen? How often was it? These kind of things. Um, were you part of a union? Were you part of any other political parties, etc.? And how were these things relating to each other? I think, again, the enclave aspect being quite important to us. Do you see par parallels to today? Um, this is particular from talking to Tatiana Schneider of uh, Glass in Glasgow. But yeah, were you open to new members? How did you... How did you kind of engage with outreach, did it shape your subsequent work, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got the kind of structure questions, then we specify a bit. And um, yeah, we basically get to look at and find really 
sexy pamphlets and things and look through them. Uh, and so, yeah, there's just basically a few kind of uh, images of the things that we've found or that we're beginning to kind of scan into a public uh, kind of internet archive. Ooh. Um, so, yeah, we've got like, things like kind of the obvious pamphlets, manifestos, etc., but also feasibility studies. Um, I've got them here. Yeah, like from um, New Architecture Movement, we've got academic articles, I guess this one, uh, journalism, photographs, kind of, we're also trying to kind of, when people mention a book, we're trying to at least get the cover of it in there from the, tra from the interviews that we hold, and obviously the transcriptions of the interviews as well, so it's trying, we're trying to kind of also like really fill out, fluff, fluff it out. Um, yeah, there's also moments where we just find like literally the really st stuff being said that we just could hear in, you know, here today, so we've got, uh, yeah, it's about like a interview with local authority architects and tenants or whatever, and it's talking about authoritarian hierarchical departments, insensitive to the needs of user and architect alike, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of kind of the same things coming through. Also interim proposals, I really like this, um, about you know, proposals of ways of working by architects. Um, and this, which is like actually a community uh, zine really, but uh, I found it and it, it's so like, um, you know, a dip 14 render kind of thing where it's like got like Renaissance paintings talking about striking. And then this person's like, um, oh, I have the quote right there. It's so good. Uh, she's like, oh, my aching belly. If you're going to make leaflets calling for assemblies and all that, it means you have to do it. You're acting as if you want the president to call for revolution. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> this is really good. Um, oh, and this is supposed to go at the end. So yeah, let's, we can go back to that maybe. And then yeah, back to Sib to talk about other stuff, I think. We're doing a bit of a, we're doing a bit of a back and forth. Yeah. Back and forth tag teaming talk. Um, so, um, so basically, uh, what we've been trying to do is untangle this sort of mess and try and find out what are the obstacles to actually what are the obstacles to like practicing in an, an ethical manner? Um, and uh, what are the obstacles that are preventing us getting an understanding of the situation in London um, as architects? So like how, where can we put our energy and how do we not fall into the same mistakes that were made in the past? Um, and so um, this might seem like a, a little bit of a jump, but it also means that we end on a positive note, so it can't be a bad thing. Um, so um, one of the things we did is we, in order to try and find out like what is preventing people from getting to the bottom of this particular problem in London regarding housing and how to, op how to operate sort of as professionals. So we organized a workshop um, with the Center of Investigative Journalism who are based at Goldsmiths University and the University of Bournemouth uh, Civic Data Labs um, who are great and know a lot about how to get people together and talk about types of information and data and that kind of thing. And so we invited people from within the council, within local councils and lawyers, um, housing activists, um, hackers, um, architects and academics. Um, we were looking at, so what, what, kind, what are the kind of data in infrastructures that are related to housing? Um, so how does that information get out to the public? Like why is the, why is the docu documentation around planning and development so opaque? Um, and there's an uh, initiative called the Open, Open Data for Tax Justice, which is a database um, which they've developed, which looks at like what corporations pay in tax and how they pay tax and where that money comes from and where does it go. Um, and if there was a public database for um, or against regeneration, um, who would use it and how would they use it and what would it contain? Um, so we did this kind of brainstorming exercise where we were looking at like all the different kinds of things that people experience. So like in regard to housing, supply and demand, like can you find information about right to buy? Can you map sort of um, existing use value of social housing and like really getting into the details of like what happens um, beyond the kind of like fluffy design project that you know involves community participation and stuff there are actually like real physical barriers to actually getting stuff done um, and can this kind of open data initiative 
start to combat the sort of insidious privatisation and neoliberalisation of the way we work through opening up areas for collaboration which were closed or obscure or buried underneath, you know, a 500-page document like the New London Plan, for example. Um, so um, the good thing is, we so we can end on a positive note because, like, there are um, other examples of how you can scale up that kind of participation. So it's not just like um, the thing that we've experienced in London, where all of the a lot there are a lot of campaigns around estate regeneration and uh, around housing, and they're all sort of hyper local because they're all very much involved in um, one estate and the people in that estate having to go on a massive uh, learning, steep learning curve to understand what's going on and only really having the energy to concentrate on that super hyper local area around where they live. So um, there are other tools that are being developed to address sort of problems of like legitimacy, like as a, an estate resident, how do you get people to listen to you? Um, participation, like who has access to this information and how and um, does that also reproduce the kind of problems that you get with gentrification? And like, if you have an open Wi-Fi network, for example, where do you put it? And who then has access to that? Who has the technology to access that in the first place? Um, and how can you make people accountable? How can you make the authorities accountable? Um, and what are the consequences that come from scaling up that kind of thing? So um, uh, this is an example that I think is really um, inspiring. In um, so in 2014, 2015 in Taiwan, there was massive um, anti-government protests, um, and uh, one of the things that that and they, they also it was kind of like the Occupy movement. They were called the Sunflower Protests, and there were lots of people taking over um, public space and having meetings and stuff. And um, one of the things that came out of that was that the government of Taiwan started using a, uh, a platform on the, on the internet called poll.east, which involved um, people writing in a statement, and then you can, you can agree or disagree, but you can't reply. And the fact that you couldn't reply removed the kind of vortex of internet sort of um, the, the tunnel of, uh, what was it, flame wars or whatever you would call them. And actually just um, after, after people have responded to this, the program will, will um, arrange the responses in a kind of diagram which shows the specific area where it overlaps. And so specifically in Taiwan, they managed to um, stop Uber from arriving into the country because of using this technology called poll.ease. And so, and it also, they managed to, to scale up the participation from sort of tens of people to 1,000s. Um, and they really, they almost rewrote the entire um, legis legislation um, within sort of six months um, of, of launching this thing. So um, basically what we're trying, what, one of the things that we're trying to do is to, is to sort of say, okay, so people are saying, you know, oh, we can't participate, we can't get people in to participate in this kind of thing, or people won't understand what's going on, and that maybe it's time to start bringing in other forms of technology and other practices into that to kind of see what happens when you massively scale up public participation in this kind of thing, and then um, maybe that will also start to talk, talk about the problems that um, like what Adam was talking about in terms of gentrification and also in terms of like bringing in other people who wouldn't normally be involved in those conversations like construction workers and all the people who are involved in, like, in the built environment. So, sorry, this is there we go, I'm, I'm done now. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no, and I just, well, we both just picked a kind of positive, well, like maybe we should be like positive about ourselves or something, but obviously we're always like positive about other things that we look to, I guess I also wanted to mention the SAAL process in post-revolutionary Portugal. I don't know if many people are familiar with that, um, but uh, very quickly, also because I'm shaky on all the stats, but um, yeah, kind of 75 uh, post-revolution Portugal um, based more or less a kind of um, radical municipal structure from residents through architects to the municipality to the government. Um, and I could go through the kind of way it kind of worked, but it basically resulted in like architects striking because residents weren't being listened to, for example. So what it did by structuring these kind of things is it meant that all the kind of ways in which we 
aim to face, right? Or the kind of ways we don't want to negate a resident because we're like bothered about ourselves and our workers' rights, but then we don't want to, you know, we want to use our work thinking about uh, labour conditions to then produce better ethical practice, etc. Like for me, this is a really great example of when those things were at a certain kind of moment in which they actually began to kind of inform each other and, and produce leverage equally. Um, and yeah, after a couple of uh, years, I think it got kind of crushed by NATO in a kind of fear of turn to communism in Portugal in the late 70s. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's a downer to end on totally. <laughs> but I shouldn't have said that last bit. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to end with kind of two, um, <laughs> two projects that kind of probably, yeah, speak to all the things we're into in quite a nice way that maybe are nice to uh, also pass on to those that don't know about them. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, very, very good audience, quietly concentrating. We're only, believe it or not, we're only about 10 minutes over. And that was a really sort of rich, intense, old fashioned lecture session. I feel like fully rewarded. So, um, the way we're going to do it is have a short break for a cup of tea and a breath of fresh air if you need that. Um, and I think we'll reconvene here at half past four. Um, for a, a, a discussion, opportunity to ask some questions, and Alex will be chairing that. So, um, and I think we'll have around half an hour to do that before we move forward to have some alcohol and celebrate a book launch. So, um, do come back, don't wander off. It's nice and warm in here now, I think. So, um, go and get yourself a tea and come back in. Thanks. I think we need about three or f three to four hours to start to unpick <laughs> um, the density and kind of urgency of some of the things we've been talking about today. But we do have another 24 hours at least. So hopefully we'll just um, start with a few comments and questions that might start the introduction, the things that we'll get into finer grain detail into over the coming um, days. Uh, one, I'll make a few comments to start you talking and then probably um, give over to the audience because I'm sure there's lots of burning questions that we want to get across in the next 30 minutes. Um, if we accept then that architecture <laughs> or spatial practices that we're all involved in are in this really tricky or precarious or contradictory position in that we're, um, everything we do is intrinsically related to labour and to production, to construction, to economic production, but also to safeguarding society, social well-being, human rights. We're always then culprits, so somehow of exploitation or criminals, <laughs> um, if you put it that far. We're kind of to blame as well as trying to, to, to save. So within that position, something that you all seem to be talking about that comes up a lot in the presentations is this question of visibility, what we can see, or trying to make things visible that were invisible. Why did we not see it before? Surely that relationship to labor and exploitation has always been there. We were talking about literally taking away plywood fences so you could see, or whistle blowing so we know. Why did we not see these things before? Or did we look away, a collective amnesia or blindness, as it were? Mm. <laughs> as architects, are yeah, you saying? Yeah, as a profession, yeah. As a profession, well. I don't know. I mean, there's that thing where, I mean, there's the, the history, the historical moment where the, all the professions were, you know, all the other professions, like the doctors and the lawyers and the surveyors, and were kind of demarcating their boundaries. Um, and the architects demarcated their boundary too, thinking that would be a good idea. But um, then, you know, everybody knows you don't need to be an architect to design a building. So maybe that happened at that moment, where the where that the moment of distancing yourself from from you know from being the architect being the sort of master builder or the site foreman or something, who was actually involved in the practical construction, to the person who is you know suddenly one step removed from what is going on. I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting because. It relates a bit to this lecture I gave at London Met when I was talking about like agency and loss and they, like these kind of things, but I can't remember exactly what made me start here. But 
Yeah, I was speaking about the kind of the eight books, ten books in architecture, and and that like at the time of kind of like the 1600s, 1700s, there was this thing of like guilds, right? There was this like keeping of secrets and keeping of craftsmanship. And actually, like, when knowledge began to get, like, disseminated and began to be, like, put in some kind of, like, something that could be called a manual, but obviously wasn't at that time. And knowledge began being this kind of, technically with intention of, like, democratic kind of spreading of info. It's quite funny that actually that, uh, not to say that I sit, uh, you know, I, I believe this fully, but it's interesting to kind of think of that idea of, like, um, the artistry element that is normally what, like... Um, and, and traps us a, a bit or has kind of fooled us into thinking that we're not workers. Um, the, the kind of early origins of that are quite interesting when you think about, yeah, this guild, like these guilds that wouldn't tell anyone what they were doing and then the kind of dissemination of, of, of knowledge on part of the architects. I mean, yeah, okay, like the one book that wasn't kind of um, elaborated was the housing book, okay, so I'm not saying there were that, you know, they had like um, all these kind of... Uh, you know, hyper democratic intentions or humble intentions of of, um, of, of architectural knowledge, but um, it's funny to think about that. Actually, I think, um, but I'm not sure if it, it you know it can be said for the turn like the the microcosm of today that you're talking about. But if we were to kind of academicize it, you could speak from there. You know. Well, yeah, I would also like to. Uh, make another question and wonder uh, somehow when the education in, in architecture started changing and I, I do believe that in recent years uh, uh, academic research, teachers and everyone that were demarcating the limits uh, are more aware of, the, of this sort of problem and this is, has been uh, I don't know if when you were students when I was a student, this was not a question at all. It was much more of a technical practice and artistic practice. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, I do believe that these questions, they are really strong uh, in our architecture schools. Mm. And also, there, I mean, let's say that there's the education and then also within that there's a fundamental distrust that develops between the architectural profession and the other professions involved in the building process. So like the, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, surveys that are put out by ROBA and people like that which say, you know, percentage of contractors satisfied by the architects that they're working with <laughs> and it's sort of something like 25% or something so there, there's like a, a fundamental distrust in the ability of architects to do what they're supposed to do um, and here we are on the other side having these conversations about what we're supposed to be doing somehow and it's almost like it feels like there's so many of these circular conversations um, that happen and also within that within education as well. Mm -hmm. Adam, is there any way we can't we can avoid being criminals in our future careers? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not. Um, <laughs> no, I mean I, I, I think the discourse of criminality is really interesting, and maybe the rights discourse too comes back to this question of visibility and invisibility, because I think visibility is 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 not just. Um, a technique to contravene power, but it's actually a technique of power. Mm -hmm. And so, especially in thinking about rights, let's say from a queer perspective, thinking around the bringing into certain forms of power uh, and bringing into kind of legibility and visibility of certain forms of power is always at the cost of a kind of other barrier or exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you see that around marriage or the military or, or, um, or, or even hate crime laws and a kind of radical pushback against these systems of power. Um, so, so the question of visibility, invisibility is interesting. As soon as you name something like slavery or the labor process, then that becomes the thing that needs to be fixed. And if it's fixed, then the system works. And so I think there's also a kind of, that visibility allows a certain kind of um, narrowing of the parameters of, of where systemic change needs to happen. Um, certainly at least in kind of modern capitalism. 
Yeah, I mean, it's also, yeah, it's, it's a queer perspective, it's a decolonial perspective, right? Mm. So you, like, you frame one particular community at the expense of framing others or by highlighting or representing one thing, you then negate the possibility for that thing you're representing to kind of have, uh, have kind of peripheral or, or diluted elements to mm. itself, right? You kind of um, rigidify it. I mean, that's kind of operation of kind of like colonial... Um, Motives, which obviously inevitably end up spatial. It's like the easiest one to kind of make spatial, right? Mm. Uh, maybe not that it's more important, but it's just like to so direct. Mm. And it has a kind of um, a boundary of built environment and kind of as well as bodies, you know, mm. and then it's very kind of direct way. But it's also what you want to get accepted into, right? Like when you say, uh, when you name something and you, it becomes visible and then you fix the problem and then it's solved and then you're accepted into it. But actually... Um, and, and that, that was the, that's the argument about um, gay marriage as well, that, you know, now that you're allowed to get married, um, that's great, you know, you can join, join the ranks of everyone else getting married, brilliant, everyone's happy. Um, well, actually, there's a lot of people who don't really want to be subsumed into that sort of het heterosexual um, hegemony of, like, this is the way things need to be. And I feel like in, in relation to, like, the way people practice, if people practice architecture, it's like what, um, there's a lot of, and that there's something I find really problematic actually, is like then there's a lot of practices which are sort of celebrated for um, sort of circumventing that capitalist um, rhetoric or like, you know, oh, we get to work, we, we're working with the community, we're participatory, we're involved in all this stuff. Um, and we support ourselves by, you know, teaching in this other neoliberal institution over here, and that's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> like, so, like, where, where? We're both part to say we're like. Yeah, we're okay, I'm pain. guilty. Guilty <laughs> as charged, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, what? Um, so then, so then, uh, so but here we are celebrating the fact that we've also managed to sort of establish this like alternative practice, right? And um, and actually, uh, we're still complicit in in another way of like how how do I educate how do I talk to my students about the work that I'm doing with concrete action when I can't actually talk about concrete action because the university have said if we lose our funding because you talk about concrete action you won't have a job anymore so it's just like there's there's all this sort of there's all the, it, it's very difficult to draw a, a border around what what um, what you want to make visible in terms of like yeah. modes of practice mm -hmm. and then not to dilute or kind of like obviously do momentum or whatever which is also the kind of thing i mean turning it back to our look on collective organization and union unionization as well i mean we have exactly the same reservations about um pre-existing or assumed structures that are apparently relevant to everyone and everything that's not the case and um, we have to be extremely careful about the way that we want to kind of achieve uh, the demands that we have, which are significantly more important than, uh, like, more important in terms of what we want in a wider sense than, like, the names by which we give our structure or the kind of roles we give or, or figureheads that we produce for that. I think that's really important to us and what we've learned from the research we've, we've done is that, yeah, um, even from the unions that I mentioned, which you know aren't necessarily to do with architecture, but it's really uh, it's it's demand driven and campaign driven, and I think that's actually really important because it also makes us maybe feel better about the the strands of research we find ourselves into, and of course we see all the symbolism in them at the same time that they feel removed, right? Or they feel like. Pff, well, yeah, like, it'll take a lecture or it'll take a public speaking to bring it back to being symbolic, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's not a problem. Luckily, we get invited to do so. Mm. Great. Mm. Um, but then this kind of, like, application back, um, I think, is, is really important and a legitimizing of this work, which is, again, why we're so lucky to do this archive project, really, because uh, in terms of the shifting and shaping ideas about how to collectively organize in London that are going on right now. We have a kind of body of work that's beginning to speak for itself mm. and not beginning to kind of be ideologically or career or, you know, structurally or um, <coughs> presumptuously set. It's not about those things. It's actually based on this quite like neutral set of research that will um, give us some ideas, I think, in a more nuanced and meaningful way. 
Um, <coughs> so that we, we are learning from, you know, we're like learning from it and being proven wrong in you know, some assumptions we made and an interviewee will say something and we're like, oh, but I was thinking, you know, whatever. Um, that's great. Um, so yeah, you know, enclave work and research work. Yeah. Okay, we're thinking of the symbolism, but also it, it does stand on its, mm. its own two feet and it can say so much. Oh. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, when you talk about visibility or invisibility and legibility, in the case of our project, we were answering the, <coughs> the public minister first. And actually, the whole discussion throughout the process was like, okay, it's a school of architecture, we have that grant, we have this situation, how do we respond to it or build up? So the, vis the visibility and invisibility was very much about for whom, uh, what. Uh, so we understood was we were the first publics, you know, the architects, and then mm. all this relationship is with uh, law. Um, so, and of course, dealing within a context that is that it was a it's a political context that's manipulating all the time. Uh, uh, so the visibility in that case it was pretty hard to find out those mm -hmm. data and to organize. Uh, and we were really careful and we were really discussing what to present, what not. And then the workers, they don't, never seen themselves as slavers, you know. And yeah. then being really respectful and how do you do that. Uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, it's, there is uh, the really uh, concrete consequences of what you choose to mm -hmm bring visible and not and uh, but that was key in that case of this research and then the symbolic of course the, we were not operating so much on the policy level although we were responding to the public ministry that would give them more tools to realize uh, because we were really like an exception of this kind of um, grant for, for mm -hmm. that operates in that mm -hmm. way because usually they say it's all uh, corruption actually, mm -hmm. goes to NGOs that just corrupt the money and so on. So, there are, yeah, it's always, I think, very situational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how law develops, right? I mean, case, I, mean, I don't know my law stuff, but like, a precedent, certain case, you know, that's what defines the yeah. thing, which is what's so, what's so interesting. I mean, as <laughs> tiny and it too is all the contradictions all the time, no? And, yeah, 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 yeah that's exactly. Part of you. And, and it's also what, you know, yeah. lawyers often fight cases that are fluid or not yet established because yeah. because it is a way to then establish a law, like an application elsewhere, yeah, right? Yeah. So it was quite interesting about your work as when I, a squad I was part of in 2010, which is still going now on West London, uh, was the first squad to get uh, an appeal based on Human Rights Act. So on Article 8, peace to right to a peaceful family life. And like, we knew we wouldn't get the thing in the end but it, the very act of getting that appeal actually shaped mm -hmm. the law in itself just by mm -hmm. that actually happening. And yeah. so we had loads of barristers really up for helping us out all of a sudden. Yeah. Whatever, you know, like, not to be dubious about that stuff, whatever. They were, like, doing loads of pro bono work. But um, this thing was interesting because it was, like, this, this precedent, which is exactly mm -hmm. what we're talking about, a case-by-case -case or a demand-based or a campaign-based thing, which mm -hmm. then shapes the structures beyond it. So, so what about new structures then? Because we're all talking about um, <coughs> exposing issues and proposing alternatives. Um, what about larger scale institutional alternatives? I mean, as you to sort of expose quite clearly, one of the key issues is the relationship between the state and the private sector. You know? And it's just so deeply ironic that um, on your list of projects in Brazil that were found to have slave labor was um, Mincasa Minvido and PAC, both of which were politically directed projects um, specifically to alleviate conditions for the poor mm -hmm. <laughs> and slum dwellers, and there they are actually reinforcing those conditions and pushing people into slave labor to deliver them. It strikes me that architects as a profession, we're always in between the public and, um, sector and the private sector. That's where we sit. Whether we're working for the public sector directly or in private practice, you're always going to be in, to, in between those two forces. How do we act there? Surely we're perfectly placed in that position to, to change things, to change those relationships, but somehow we can't. Um, maybe that's not an amnesia. Maybe what we need is new institutional structures. Maybe it's not all our fault as individuals that we're all sinners, <laughs> uh, we're all guilty. Maybe there's something that we need from our kind of education institutions or our professional institutions, and therefore what could those be? Well, you can describe it as, if you describe it as between, it sounds like we're like the filling in the sandwich. 
<laughs> which is like not necessarily a very proactive way of being, I guess. Um, mm. And that maybe you don't want to be, you, rather than being between, you kind of want to be able to, um, you want to be able to direct exactly. the, the angles of how these things relate to each other. Um, yeah, yeah, that act of translation, which I think was... Um, I mean, there was one project that we did last year, or was it the year before now, which was about um, re rewriting or like rewriting the ethical code for architects in the UK. Um, and um, but the the problem that we ran up against was um, we actually did it with master students from here. I think there are some. I recognise some. Um, and one of the things we ran up against was then if if we if we have a new code for like the way we practice or how we relate to those other um, stakeholders, um, what is the incentive for people to act according to it? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's also quite interesting related mm. to the the, the the language of of, of of law and like criminality and stuff. And I don't mean this as a a critique at all, but we had, you know, the crux of a lot of our conversations were like, mm -hmm. okay, so is it a badge of honor or is it a disciplinary? Mm -hmm. You're gonna egg the window, or you're gonna give them a plaque, you know, like what, like, and, and you know, we, we haven't got as far as deciding one or the other, but it's a really interesting conversation, I think, based on, you know, I know about institutional structures, but even just like the mode of engagement of whatever structure actually we're kind of learning is what defines the structure. So, like, I think that alone is like a very interesting one and like, um, yeah, this is kind of what that that project kind of ended up being quite concerned with. I mean, I mean, beyond yeah. a code, it strikes me the situation in Brazil is just having a role, <laughs> like mm -hmm. where architects didn't have any power to direct mm -hmm. those oh, relationships yeah. between labour, capital, design, Macassar and Vida at the airport. Mm -hmm. You're just impotent in the sense that you're brought in to do specific things, whatever your ethics are. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, I believe that, that there has been a dismantling process since the 1990s. So there, there are laws that are taking the architects apart of any possibility of decision or anything. And somehow the architects just accepted that. Huh. I, I think that it's, it's really hard, but it's going to be a, a, a huge process until we, we, we gain uh, space for discussion uh, regarding that yeah. uh, and regarding our institutions as well. So the, qu the equivalent of the RIBA in Brazil, which is right. CAO, uh, it's like an institution uh, that it's also corrupt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you do have like this... Uh, Architects uh, specialized in this sort of politics that it's within these structures. Right. Uh, so uh, last year, um, uh, a group of architects that they were no, we, we, we must. That's a, a starting point. Let's uh, uh, have a, a party candidate to this institution, and they won. And after the first meetings, they said, "Well, we didn't win." It's yeah. just like the same. Uh, we, we, we don't have the power to, to change this system inside the, the own uh, representative yeah. institutions. So. Well, speaking of space of discussion, I'd like to turn to the audience. Having been dismantled um, as architects, are there any questions or comments about how we can find a new role, remantle ourselves? Do we have a roving mic? Following from what you were just saying, I, I, I think that visibility is one of the things that we have in common, but the other thing is obviously um, legal frameworks. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, so, so in this relationship with, uh, with the state that we architects have, um, what really comes to mind uh, to, after seeing Adam appealing to the UN and uh, to all the, the legal definitions of what is a crime and you 
uh, trying to decode the planning, the, 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 the planning process, and when do residents have a voice within that timeline of the planning process? And you, your project springing from, from a prosecution of yeah. a construction company. Yeah. Um, what springs to mind is really, uh, does the law, as in the law which is written by the state or by institutions that go beyond the architectural profession institutions, have more agency than we have? Mm. And how, as architects, and how do we um, have, c how can we have a voice within those higher institutions which actually produce the law um, for us to, to regulate our profession, not only the architectural profession as traditionally thought about, but the spatial practices, uh, so we can uh, step up these practices with, which are the moment, as, as you have illustrated here, uh, are based on the denunciation of what should not be done. And that denunciation opens a lot of spaces for practice and a lot of spaces for, for projects to uh, uh, be the custodians of, of the do's and the don'ts of our profession. Mm -hmm. But how can we just step up from that yeah. to regularize? I mean, if you, I think it's a really great point, uh, but it, if you have to think of it from a Brazilian perspective, we have a very sophisticated legislation uh, uh, for participatory, I mean, in the last 20 years, very recent, um, when we, after our dictatorship. But uh, it's so contradictory because, uh, and one of the texts we have in the book by a historian, he brings the whole history in Brazil that uh, uh, it's actually, we have like <coughs> the legislation and the custom, the habit, they're really opposite. Uh, so it's, you all, the, the legislation is only for few people and for the rich and uh, whenever it uh, makes sense, you know. So this, even this prosecution case is really an exception within the whole system. Um, so indeed, the legislation, it's really key within an institutional Western way of thinking and operating as a state. Um, but it's, I think it's getting so more, much more complex uh, because, because of this dismantling and, uh, and uh, talking about legibility. It's not, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but uh, it's not given. It seems like it's every time in which, in a specific cases, how you operate, and uh, yeah. it's getting more complex. It's true. I mean, uh, and you feel like more um, handicapped, or I don't know how to say it. I don't know if I was clear, but it's just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually really it's really interesting to think about that. Um, it's specifically in a UK context now um, after the after the Grenfell fire that um, there was a there was obviously a massive reaction so what ha what has happened here and um, and the focus was on well one of the focuses was on regulations and the building regulations and um, why haven't the building regulations been reformed um, and how long has it taken and um, I don't know if anyone's been following this, that actually now um, the building regulations for fire are being reformed, but they're actually being diluted, not strengthened, and that's due to lobbying from the construction industry. Mm -hmm. um, and the architect architecture as a profession has been completely silent on this. Um, the, the ROBA said it was disappointing. I mean, it's more than disappointing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, who's going to... Where, where there, there needs to be some political will from within architecture to actually stand up and do something about it as well. And I feel like there's some kind of... There's, there is a reluctance from within architecture to stick your head up over the edge and be like, actually, no, I'm not going to specify materials that are unsafe for this building, and I'm not going to allow myself to enter into a contract with a contractor who will have the power to cut the costs to the point to re-specify materials that are dangerous. And architects really should have, really should stand up and take the power to do that, but for some reason they're not. Mm -hmm. 
And so then it's like, well, who are you aligning yourself with as a professional? Are you aligning yourself with, like, I mean, I know from my work with community groups, you want to align yourself with the people who have the power. Like, you want to talk to people who have power, not, you don't want to waste your time talking to people who are, who are not going to be able to influence the way things are going. So is it a question of aligning ourselves? If right now the architects find themselves in a powerless position, drifting around in the center of all this stuff. So who are we going to align ourselves with to gain the influence back? Or like, when are we going to start like putting our head above the parapet? <laughs> and, and there is also another contradiction, because there were many contradictions regarding this project is that uh, even within the legal system in Brazil, uh, this is really uh, an, an exceptional case and a very rare case, but when you talk to the to people that work within the, the legal system, they say that they, uh, because we were worried that this was somehow uh, a deal that was made uh, to, to, to you know, get things easier. We were really concerned with that. But the people that work within the legal system, they said, no, this is not, because the law system can make this go to the first, uh, first step of the uh, first court, then the second, then the federal, and this could take years of legal prosecution. And in the end, this was like uh, the deadline would, would, we would get to the deadline and it would, the, probably the company would not even be fined. So, they, uh, they, they do this, some of these people that work within the legal system, they decide to do that <coughs> as a counter-conduct, you know, uh, within the legal system. Uh. Because that's, a, that's the way they've, they've found to work within the law and uh, get the right punishment, uh, you know. Because within the legal system, this, could, the, this company would probably, you know, never, they, they would always have the best uh, uh, lawyers, banisters, and they could get out of it without paying for it. Can I ask? Oh, sorry. I just want to add one little, one little thought. Um, I don't, there's also just a, there, there seems to be a kind of agreement in the room that if only architects were left to get on with it, that things would be better. Or if only, you know, as if architects <laughs> are sort of some sort of, um, have some sort of kind of ethical, um, you know, proto-alternative future. And I, and I think there's a danger in that as well. <laughs> And so a kind of real reconsideration of the way architects are, are taught and trained yeah. uh, pedagogically. And then, and then I think, like you're saying, kind of coalitions across with multiple other kind of disciplines and, and spaces, mm -hmm. not just can the architect get more power in this process, mm -hmm. um, but, but how, does, how does architecture kind of change itself to, mm -hmm. to reimagine its, its, its mm -hmm. role in the process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I was just thinking that the, some of those responses go to this question of um, what made me think that, um, you know, architects are really risk averse. I mean, I was just thinking of Sid's comment that, um, mm. you know, this, this sort of, we, we, we somehow don't respond to the sort of <coughs> movements that are made by others. And I wonder if, like, the structure of, of architect service agreements and the way in which risk is taken away, and the way that we're paid for service, mm gives us a very risk-averse sort of sensibility compared to, let's say, other creative producers who take all the risk in the production of their object. Mm. And it, it just sort of does feel that this sort of risk aversion means that there's not sufficient, um, I don't know, ability to resist within the, the profession itself. I don't know. Mm. That's really interesting. Mm. I think it goes back to, it goes back to that... that um, crisis of existential crisis which I hate talking about <laughs> where you're like well um, if we didn't if we didn't do it if we were if we didn't do the work that we're doing as as in general architects not as like us specifically here and here then mm -hmm. someone else would probably do it and it would be fine I mean it would just be maybe slightly less designed maybe it would be more functional but it would definitely yeah. work <laughs> which is kind of that's and then it's kind of like well how what then how do we justify how do we justify our existence in that I guess I was thinking that if it's if it's not a sort of that's the problem with architects they're risk averse but if, if the whole structure of our profession the way we pay ourselves 
doesn't means that we refuse to take risks, <coughs> then we then if that was reorientated, mm. would we have more agency in the sense that we would be more would would mm. to take risk and risk is what's mm. needed for change. I don't know, it's just a proposition. Mm. This question over there. I think along that line, like you mentioned about the construction company not deciding not to work with construction companies, but if you look at Novated Design Build, for example, you are given to, you know, your, your client is a developer until halfway through the project, to which point your client is suddenly the contractor. And so I think that's part of what you're saying too, is that the contracts are set up in a way to be risk averse and to protect ourselves. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a systemic issue so that we don't have a choice. It becomes less of a choice of I'm not going to work with that contractor because halfway through the project you find out who the contractor is. Okay, do we have time for any more questions or comments before we go to the book launch? Particularly from students, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering like, so I think there's been some really interesting points, but wondering how do we take these points into the mainstream? Because there are plenty of architectural professionals that are happy just to work within the current structures and the current systems. And how can we change those systems? <laughs> Any easy answers to that one? <laughs> <laughs> I can have one direct suggestion, which is the RIDA um, have started an ethics commission, and I think we should all tile in on the RIDA's ethics commission. Mm. Perhaps otherwise it would just get watered down into a, a planned document. So I think the volunteer to go and present themselves to the ethics commission. Mm -hmm. yeah, very concrete. More concrete action. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Any other questions a, or comments? I, d I, think, I think there is a... In terms of like... I, d I don't think people should be... Uh, criticised for wanting to go to work, do their work go, and go home at the end of the day and just get paid for it. I mean, even if I don't personally want to do that, I don't, I don't feel like I should be judging people for just wanting to have a um, normal, you know, existence. And so in terms of like, in terms of like changing the structure, like changing institution, like those kind of big institutional structures, um, kind of relates to what um, you were saying about uh, like how these large companies end up working on in in these kind of projects mm -hmm. and then um, and then it's less about the individual like your individual choice about where you're going to go and work and more about um, about uh, sort of can can there be like, is there a possibility for the profession or for people working in the built environment to form a kind of collective force? <laughs> like, I don't know if that's a possible thing. Like, it would be great if it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, sorry, I no, think, no. do you want to go ahead? No. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there, uh, one thing is that these things aren't mutually exclusive. So just because there's a systemic issue that's impossible to maybe change through a, an active agency doesn't mean active agencies aren't important or necessary. And so kind of not to play a game of of, um, of throwing one's hands up in a sense. And then, but I'm, I'm the only space that I kind of uh, engage in as an agent is in spaces of, of pedagogy. And so I think... And it's not just architects who I think need different kinds of training, but on the other side where I come from, the social sciences are so unwilling to engage in discussions around the questions of design or spatial reasoning. And there's a real resistance on that side too. So it's not just a kind of thinking around what kind of education are architects getting, but if there is a kind of lens around the spatial that might be a, a space for a kind of resistant politics, how do we think about um, allowing that kind of pedagogy to go into other spaces too? Yeah. Yeah, because we, we love being like, this random thing that feels like it's not got anything to do with space mm. does. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we love doing that for ourselves. <laughs> um, and, like, that's, you know, yeah, I love it, too. Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, that, like, ap application of knowledge mm. uh, without d having, like, expertism, right, which is this other thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
which uh, she kind of like touched on in other ways. But the application of uh, kind of yeah, like spatial thinking. I mean, like I don't have many architect friends, luckily. Um, and so, <laughs> like uh, when I like have when I bother to kind of talk in a bit more detail after a couple of beers about this thing, I think or the the, the ways in which my one you know I don't know communist poet friend is saying one thing and then like I'm like oh blah, blah, blah. then they're like really quite amazed by that actually and there's loads of discussion that can come from that and I kind of similar even in a personal level forget to kind of or don't take opportunity to like apply mm. not like hog the show with my knowledge but like apply and do that translation work you know where we're constantly translating other uh, ac academic or pedagogical or or labor-driven kind of issues into our own kind of enclave, right? We love that, but um, back out again is a funny one. And it often only com comes in terms of like a activist work, which is, you know, like unfortunately not, you know, the hottest thing that gets everyone on, on board, you know, that's another discussion to have, but there's something going on there for sure. Maybe the translation exercise for us those closer to home as architects is that just the translation into building on the construction site. I'm struck by the image of Lena Bobardi on site in Maspi, mm -hmm. and she's one of the construction workers, and she doesn't really have an office, and she takes her office to the site and builds yeah. a project. Maybe if we then went one step further forward and we had to employ the labor force and take care of them and we yeah. reclaim that ground, that might start to translate or reclaim some of that territory. But how we would do that on something at the scale of an airport... <laughs> or a mass building program of housing for the poor or something where it's so much a governmental level, I have no idea because it would be way, be, it's a much bigger scale of institution and, and operation beyond the scale of one building or one, one project or one architecture practice. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions or comments? Yes, please. I just want to make a point about um, working for contractors. We don't have a relationship with contractors. Can we pass the microphone just so it gets recorded? Sorry. Thanks. We have a contract with the owner, and the owner has a contract with the contractors. We don't have a relationship with the contractors. Yeah. So in, in all of this discussion about that relationship, we, don't, we need to construct that. It's not there. It's mm. not that we're doing it badly. We don't have it. Mm. It's, mm. it's part of the institution of architecture and the creation of the profession that we do not have a relationship with contractors. It's a problem. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But we do have to, we do have to communicate with contractors. If there's even if there's no legal, relate le legal contractual relationship between us and the contractor on a particular project, there's a definite, ch there's a channel of communication which is already open, in terms of like drawing, site visits, you know that kind of discussion. You know, no, we we all know that there's we talk to them and. They have our working drawings and whatever, but it's not insignificant that we do not have a legal relationship with them, which is why someone like Zaha Hadid or you know whatever, you know, can say there is no obligation. There is it's not our responsibility legally. It is absolutely right. It's not our responsibility. Mm. So some, something needs to change around that if we're going to have this discussion. Mm. Mm. We were supposed to end on um, positive calls to action. It is a positive well. direction. Yeah. Sorry, there was one more question. Yeah. Can we pass the microphone? Two, just to say, I think it was two. This lady had her hand. A bit. Hi. Thanks. I've uh, enjoyed the entire discussion. Um, I'm on the ethics commission. <laughs> so I look forward to hearing more about. We're going to have beers in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Find yeah. us in an hour. So if you've got the new ethical code sorted. <laughs> Save me a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, can we get involved? Come and speak to me afterwards. My name's Alistair Dixon. Okay. Thanks. I think this lady had some. Thank you. I was uh, just thinking maybe one huge problem about uh, the profession and ourselves feeling so almost helpless in this lies within the, within the profession, not necessarily in relationship to contractors, maybe as well, of course, but uh, the whole idea of individual power, of 
the individual as architect, or as architect, or whatever, like uh, kind of the lack of feeling of togetherness, or we, or the like common action, and of course in the professional bodies, possibly all over the world, doesn't matter where. Uh, the representatives of the professions are, of course, uh, strong and kind of keeping to this ego-driven power structure. And most of us, the rest of us, kind of, even even if we, uh, probably it's kind of deeply rooted because the image that architects project towards uh, society, we are like being seen and society largely expects from us to be like the architect with capital A and not like really our involvement with with social issues and with society at large. So possibly this starts of course with, with education and everyone is kind of more or less complying uh, with this but maybe the changing the change in this direction <coughs> is going to bring some some more direct results for action, so to say. The changing of the the perception of of, of the image. Like I don't, other professional bodies are not like I don't know maybe <coughs> doctors. Not not really. We have this feeling of like being <coughs> something different, something very particular, very individualistic, or something that that is. I don't I don't know where it comes from, but it's kind of really tragic that we stick to this kind of. <laughs> and most people that 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 actually need this image for themselves, for their own ego, keep. Oh, I know where it comes from. I'm sorry. I know where that comes from. Um, in 1835, <laughs> where the RBA was first established, there was this person called T.S. Donaldson, who should have gone to jail. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, he defined architects, and this is written in the first uh, uh, organizing uh, meeting of the RBA of, for establishing the institute. He defined architects as men of taste, men of science, men of honor. Mm. Uh, so we are going to leave the men issue aside. Um, <laughs> uh, but what, what happened there was that the architect was defined through the very um, the, the, the very skill of producing a beautiful thing, right? And that doesn't define the architectural profession from its start as providing a service. It is providing a kind of aspirational status, a status of beauty. So that, that is where it comes from. That should have been criminalized. Our laws uh, yeah. made a bit of an attempt yeah. with the, with, with, with the ornaments and crime yeah. text. But uh, I guess I will ask Adam if, uh, how long, uh, how far are you going to pursue your... your Retribution. Your, <laughs> <Yeah>. your idea <laughs> of criminalizing gentrification. Mm. An answer. Well, I, I, I think in my talk, it, that in, in, in the thought project of this 30-minute talk, it kind of stopped, because I'm not sure that the legal system, which is set up, in a sense, to enable um, processes of oppression is the space to look for a solution for it. Mm. So I think, no, it's, it's not about criminalizing. Mm. Um, it's, it's something else. I just want to pick up one tiny thing. On, one on last point, yeah. yeah. Oh, just uh, tight, like on authorship and individualization of uh, creative labor, etc. cetera, um, just a tiny thing, like it spans a lot of like what we talk about and like a number of projects from um, organizations and campaigns and, and projects coming from a position of anonymity as a, a absolute act against kind of like uh, glorification and authorship. Um, uh, one, it's quite obvious, also like collective authorship and the collective figure of an architect, right? So if we go back to Sal, 
which is here, and like a lot of the kind of inspirational projects that we've found throughout the archive or just in general research, there's really been a significant collectivization of the figure of both authorship and responsibility, and that is a theme throughout. Um, and I think that should be, I think everyone should kind of uh, consider in, in their minds exactly how to kind of go about uh, that in their future and in, in their practices, how to kind of collectivize authorship and collectivize then responsibility, but also like possibility and all these other things. I think that it's a, it's, it's a bit of a nuanced discussion, but uh, yeah, I definitely notice in these projects there's always been a collective figure, and I think that's really, really important actually. And it's definitely important in uh, what collective organization we might need to do to achieve any of the things that we're talking about to get campaigns, to get demands, to get other things at the forefront, and not those people who are responsible for them, you know. At the most, like a retrospective where someone mentions it and it ends up in a pamphlet that our little mini uses in five years, 50 years might find, but like Max, this is not about that. Um, and all action mentioned today is not about that, right? So. Can I suggest that we continue our thought experiments next door with the book launch and maybe the alcohol will help with more collective action? Great. <laughs> um, before we go, could we have a round of applause for our panel? Thank you.